Good morning and welcome to City Hall. I'm delighted to have everybody here today. We're going to begin the meeting uh, with an invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. We have uh, Dr. J.A. Reed here, who's pastor of Fairview Missionary Baptist Church, to provide the invocation for us. And Councilman Stone will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance following that. Would everyone please stand? And all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, humbly, sincerely, and reverently, we come. We thank you, our Father, for your goodness and kindness, your loving and tender mercies toward all of us. We thank you for this is this day, for it's the day you've made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Grateful for this occasion that brought us together. Another Tuesday city council meeting here in our city. We ask the blessings and benediction now upon the council. We, our mayor, our assistant mayor, as she presides today. City council, city manager, each council member, and all of the administrative staff. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that these deliberations here today will serve to make our city a more safer and a better place in which to live. Give our understanding and strength to our leaders of our city as they commit and dedicate themselves to help us to become better citizens. And may we always be mindful of the fact of thou divine guidance that you give us each day of our lives, that we commit ourselves wholeheartedly to you, that you will work through us with your divine guidance and leadership to help us to, in a united way to be a blessing to each individual citizen of our city. We thank you now. For in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. See, is that working already? Well, we have one citation that we're going to read this morning. And let me get in position to do that and ask our friends from the Stevenson Cancer Institute and the Oklahoma City Zoo to please come forward. And we have a citation to present to you all, and we'd like to ask the clerk to read it for us, please. Whereas summer will soon begin, and with it, thousands of Oklahoma City residents and visitors will take to the great outdoors to enjoy the city's many playgrounds, aquatic centers, and golf courses. Whereas which such outings can greatly improve the health and well-being of children and adults on many levels, care should be taken to protect against sunburn. Whereas, according to the American Cancer Society, excessive sun exposure can contribute to melanoma and other types of skin damage. Whereas regular use of sunscreen can provide excellent protection against sunburn and significantly reduce the risk of developing melanoma. However, sunscreen is often the forgotten item when planning outdoor activities. The Stevenson Cancer Center, in conjunction with Miles Against Melanoma, has stepped forward to provide numerous sunscreen stations throughout the Oklahoma City Park System. The Stevenson Cancer Center is a nationally recognized leader in research and patient care and is committed to raising the level of cancer awareness and prevention among individuals and serves as a resource for patients, health professionals, and communities. Whereas the Stevenson Cancer Center Sunscreen Dispenser Initiative is consistent with the objectives of the SunSmart City Program, which is administered by the Live SunSmart Foundation with the goal of encouraging communities to live a sun-smart lifestyle. 
Press, the stations will be free to the public and stocked with SPF 30 sunscreen. Whereas to provide maximum benefit, the sunscreen stations will be placed at heavily used playgrounds, spray grounds, pools, family aquatic centers, and golf courses throughout the Oklahoma City Park System. Now therefore, David Holt, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby thank and commend the Stevenson Cancer Center for its commitment to protecting the health of Oklahoma City residents and visitors through its generous donation of sunscreen stations for free use at locations throughout the Oklahoma City Park System. Thank you so much, Francis. Let's give them all a big round of applause for this partnership. <laughs> You know, I think one of the things that we're most proud of in Oklahoma City these days is the number of collaborations and partnerships that we have. And I see our Parks Director, Doug Cupper, here. We're joined up here on the stage not only by the Stevenson Cancer Center, but by uh, Miles Against Melanoma and our zoo. So as you heard, a number of these stations will be located not only in our parks and aquatic centers, but also out at the zoo, which has a lot of people and a lot of sun, as we said earlier this morning. So it's a great opportunity. And I thought you might take this moment to share with us a little bit about the project. So as many of you have seen um, in the last couple of weeks, Stevenson Cancer Center recently received its National Cancer Institute designation, which means we represent um, the top two of cancer centers nationwide. Yay. And our mission, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we're one of 70 cancer centers to receive that national accreditation. So it means big things for our state. Um, the mission is to re reduce the burden of cancer for all Oklahomans, and the Sun Smart City initiative is through the Stevenson Cancer Center and community partners like the zoo and Miles Against Melanoma Oklahoma to really make sure that Oklahomans are living Sun Smart to reduce the burden of cancer and the incidence of skin cancer um, across the spectrum of time. Well, it's a fabulous initiative. We appreciate your leadership in this. One more round of applause, if you don't mind, for everybody. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Sorry, you get an amateur up here and I can't remember, I'm supposed to give them their proclamation, not just read it to them, but actually let them have it. So I think this is time to officially call the meeting to order and item three are the um, items from Office of the Mayor. I don't believe we have any of those this morning. Uh, moving on to item four, those are the Journal of Council Proceedings. Item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for May 8th and 15th. And item B is to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for April 24th and May 1st. Second. We've got a motion and a second. All in favor, please cast your votes. And that motion passes unanimously. Item five is the request for uncontest uncontested continuances. City Manager. So, Vice Mayor, we have uh, several starting on page 27 under item 9D1, item B, 3300 South Post Road. We ask that that be stricken, the owner is repaired. And then moving to item 9E1, H904 South Pennsylvania. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Item J1402 Southwest 2nd Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner secured. Item L2501 Northwest 12th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item O3001 Northwest 17th Street. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Item R. 2229 Northwest 33rd Street. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Moving to page 28, under item W, 4006 Northwest 50th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item 9F1, 904 South Pennsylvania. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. H, 1402 Northwest 2nd Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item I, 2501 Northwest 12th Street. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And finally, item L, 3001 Northwest 17th Street. We ask that that be stricken. We need to re-notify. Great, thank you. Are there any other requests for uncontested continuance? Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to item six, which are revocable permits. We have one of those today. And our friend Chad Hodges is here to talk about 
the um, Oklahoma City Pro-Am Bike Race, which is coming up uh, June 1st through 3rd. Three locations again, Midtown, Film Row, and Automobile Alley. So welcome back, Chad. Thank you. Thanks for having us back. Uh, like Meg said, um, our event is June 1st through 3rd. Uh, we're the Oklahoma City Pro-Am Classic, which is a three-day criterium event, uh, so cycling. Uh, we race in Midtown, Film Row, and then Automobile Alley. Uh, this year we also have a Fondo, which is a tour. Uh, this will be our third year for that. It's it's growing slowly but surely, uh, but it's nice because it offers something for cyclists of all abilities. And then we've also partnered with Red Coyote to offer a one-mile run uh, Friday night and Saturday. So just different ways for people to be active uh, the first through the third. Right, and Chad, I think you also are doing this in conjunction with H and 8th on June 1st, so uh, Midtown's going to be busy. Yes, ma'am. I hope it, it should be packed. It should be a really good time. Great. Fantastic. Anybody have any questions? Is there a motion? And second. Thank you very much. Cast your votes. And that motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. We have six items. Cast your votes, and that motion passes unanimously. We will now recess the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. We have seven items on the PPA today. Again, cast your votes, please, and that motion passes unanimously. We will now adjourn the OC MFA. And, oh, sorry about that. We did that. <laughs> we will adjourn the OCPPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. And we have three items today on the EAT. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. And the EAT passes unanimously. We will now adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. A second we have a motion and a second uh, manager we have a couple of significant things on this agenda one of which is the discussion of incentives for the Amazon facility and um, I think that's important enough that we might want to wait until the mayor returns uh, for the meeting so I'd like to move that item uh, to the end of agenda until the mayor arrives um, are there any other questions or individual considerations on the consent docket We do have a presentation this morning from Eric Winger on item AA, or at least a discussion. That's the uh, uh, softball improvements. I, I'd like to uh, AL. AL, James? Yes. Add AW1 and 2. Anybody else? Let's, so, should we go ahead with Eric and then we'll... so, so we do have a very good update this morning regarding the ASA Hall of Fame project and this is going to be item AA for you this morning. Um, we did receive bids on this. This was a 2017 bond program project that was actually prioritized by the City Council with a lot of the commitments that were made to the NCAA. And as I kind of review this very quickly with you, what you're approving or being considered for approval today is the award of contract to Timberlake Construction Company um, in the amount of 18 million three hundred and ninety eight thousand dollars for the final two phases of construction activities to occur at the site you might recall this project had four major phases two of those phases have been completed but in the 2017 bond this will allow the additional improvements to the lower level providing connections um, to the first and third base team sides it also has the concourse level improvements um, which enhance a lot of the media functions there's the upper concourse which is two additional restrooms again additional ADA enhancements and then the upper level seating, seating expansions as well. The thing to note is that this is really a two-year project, and so construction is expected to begin immediately this summer, but it will then subside for um, softball games next year. Um, so it will be suspended, but then it will resume the following summer in 19 to then race to completion. And so we're going to be working very closely with the schedules, the events there at the site, but very good bids. We had six bidders. All the bids were below our budget. We're also able to award the two ad alternates that were part of the project. So with that, I can provide any additional updates. Really, the big takeaway on this is that uh, we kind of timed the 17 bond issue because we had to make this commitment to, to accommodate the NCAA. And so uh, we had to do this expansion. 
uh, we were able to bring it in within budget. We're on schedule, and so we are on track to keep the Softball Hall of Fame long term in Oklahoma City. We're we've got the contract, but we have to. If we don't perform, they can leave, and so we're performing. So we should be able to maintain that event here for for a number of years. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric, very much. Uh, James, why don't we go ahead with AL? Yeah, AL is a uh, it's a. I guess we call it a joint project between us and uh, ODOT for State Highway 4, which is also called Piedmont Road. Um, it's something that I've mentioned in the past. Uh, there's been a number of uh, fatal accidents out there, and so it, it's not, not the safest road. Um, but our, our part of the project is uh, uh, the right-of-way and utility improvements. Um, and so that, that's what this, this actual item uh, does ODOT's construction plan is uh, to begin in 2019 and then be completed in fall of 2021. And so I just wanted to uh, uh, point that out that the, the improvements are going to be from State Highway 66 all the way up to Northwest Expressway on, um, on Piedmont Road. So, Great. Thank you, it. James, very much. Um, Ed, AW1 and 2. Brent, can I, or I, anyone? Um, I don't remember, of course, I have the memory of a goldfish sometimes, but I don't remember in past years, it would say that bo both of these incentives for, for job creation, it says the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber Economic Development Division recommends a local incentive package of 100000 for Dura Coatings, the $1.25 million. Um, on, for CACI, is that is that how we've? I mean, how long have we done that? Where the chamber makes the recommendation of well, the incentive? Historically, the way it works is the chamber works with the site selectors, and um, gets all the data, and we put it into an economic impact model, and then they make a recommendation based on that to myself and Kathy O'Connor, and we um, bless it or reduce it, do something like that. And then we make an offer to a company. And that's kind of the basis for why that says that. But it's based on, they're the, they're the, the gatekeeper on that, working with all the site selectors in our program. And, um, but we as staff um, are in agreement with the recommendation. If we're not in agreement with the recommendation, it doesn't come forward. So, uh, but they, they're the ones that do the economic impact on the projects, and that's how that works. So how, what percentage of the time would you and Kathy alter the recommendation from the Chamber's Economic Development Division? Um, I think very seldom, because we're, we have a parameter in how we look at projects and how we look at the return on investment to the community through local taxes, both sales tax and property taxes. So uh, we kind of have an understanding as to what's appropriate. Have you, so, have you ever altered the Chamber's? Yes. Okay. And is that written down somewhere where we could see what the chamber recommended and what actually ended up coming um, before the Economic Development Trust and the council? Typically, yeah. I mean, to that, we don't have a report to that. I'm sure it's probably ascertainable. Right. Yeah. That's ascertainable. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'd like to see that, please. Okay. And the chamber, now the chamber is an unelected body. It receives donations from corporations for its that's part of its revenue package. Do we have a way of knowing if these companies that are receiving these incentives have made donations to the chamber, or do we, would we have any way of knowing that? No, no, sir, we did not do that. So you wouldn't have any way of knowing, for example, if Amazon had, had made a donation to the chamber, or Duracoat, or CACI, or any of the other entities that we've given awards to? No. Okay. Did you, did you sign non-disclosure agreements with either of these companies, CACI or Dura Coatings? No, sir. Why, why not? I was not required to. And that, is that, that's required by the company? Typically the companies, now I can't say for the chamber, more than likely the chamber signed some type of NDA, but I can't speak for the chamber on these two. Uh, that is kind of a standard practice where a company will request the chamber to um, uh, sign an NDA um, as they're looking at various 
you know, locales as to whether where to expand. And that's that's kind of the standard um, in the industry. Okay. But it, for me, I, I did not sign an NDA on this. Well, I certainly have other questions on that, but as it relates to Amazon, so I guess we're just deferring all discussion we're until gonna, we get. We're going to defer the Amazon. Until we get another vote. Okay, uh, that's all I have. Alrighty, David, so you had um, AI. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> Eric, uh, would you mind coming up and visiting with us for just a second about the item on AI? It's the uh, resurfacing and reconstruction of Southwest 164th Street from Southwestern to South uh, Santa Fe. And <clears throat> so my only question is, do you know if we'll be able to push this through the summer before school begins, or will it go beyond September? Or so August? in working with Cleveland County, I think the intent is to have the work done over the summer. It is their peak season. They have this as a priority project for both the city of Oklahoma City and the city of Moore. I don't have the exact dates, but that is the, that is the plan. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for working with both the city of Moore and Cleveland County on, on getting this project put, to, put together. It's been a... a a street that's received, you know, comments over the past several years, and I really do appreciate uh, you working jointly with those three other entity, uh, two other entities, to get this accomplished. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, I would like to mention two things, as is my habit. Um, item 7T is a resolution um, approving a public art acquisition agreement with Midtown Rotary, and this is for um, Red Andrews Park. And I really would like to thank. Red Andrews Park, and we've got a representative. Why don't you come on, on and uh, share with us a little bit about this project, if you don't mind. I'm Randy Marks, Associate Planner in the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs. So at Red Andrews, we had about just short of $4,800 in 1% for art funds to do public art in Red Andrews. Representative of Midtown Rotary approached me and said, we would like to donate some money they came forward and donated $7,000 with the approval of the council. So if the council approves, then we'll move ahead with this project. It's incredibly wonderful. And you might just mention um, 7U as well. I love some of these small, very small art projects. And this is a not to exceed $4,000 in Denison Park. This is a really fun little project. We were approached by Parks Department staff. Uh, saying that they would like to see chainsaw carving in Denison Park. Uh, we talked with neighborhood residents. They like the idea. And so we've negotiated with Tom Zimmer of Oklahoma Chainsaw Carving to do a piece of chainsaw art in Denison Park. And the neighborhood seems to be real excited about it. Randy, isn't this a situation where we had trees damaged? And so this is a way to actually make lemonade out of lemons. It is. That was the genesis of the project. As it turned out, the trees were so badly damaged that they couldn't be used, unfortunately. But uh, the, uh, everybody liked the idea so much that uh, we were able to go ahead with um, some other wood that the uh, artist was going to provide and move ahead with the project. And it'll be in the place where the trees were. So it'll be as if we used them. Great. But it'll last longer. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions on the consent docket? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. And that passes unanimously. And that was for every item. That was for every AX. item other than AX, which has been moved to later in the agenda. Uh, we'll now move to the concurrence docket, item 8. And. Are there any individual items uh, for consideration on the concurrence docket? We have 13 items today, the majority of which relate to the Water Utilities Trust, and then concurrence uh, on the PPA with the uh, Fairgrounds Barn Replacement and the Civic Center Sound System Upgrades. Comments or questions? Cast your votes. And the concurrence docket passes unanimously. We will move on two items requiring separate votes and we begin with item 9a which is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval uh, this is spud 1027 address is 4500 northeast 23rd street and the request is uh, to move from r1 single family residential 
and C3 Community Commercial District to SPUD 1027. Uh, I believe that the applicant is here, Charles Chapman. Would you like to tell us about the project? This is one that has been uh, deferred a couple of times. Yes, um, I'm in the process of developing that property, which was unimproved when I purchased it back in 2013. And I've been just working on, you know, doing ex excavation work in order that I can develop it. And uh, the part in question is actually the rear half of that 5.3 acre track. And the plan is in the future to develop the front half into um, a complex, a retail complex. But I want to start with that back half because it's more within reach financially. So I understand some of the discussion has surrounded, has surrounded the concern that the back half being RV storage could become a bit of an eyesore if we don't work on the front part. So did I understand correctly that you have a plan well, yes, I'm for gonna, the front? Yeah, the, the plan is to develop the front half into a retail business complex. And the issue we ran into was there's no water right there at that location. So until we can get over the water hurdle, then we're going to work on, like I said, developing the back half. And it will be well maintained. I've been doing business in the area since 88 and without any issues as far as the city complaining about any of my activities. And I'm going to continue to do that. Okay, great. Well, this. Um was recommended for approval. Does anybody have any comments or questions? I do, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Looks like there's a, a tree buffer, I guess, just to the south of your property line. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So, and the plan is for it to stay. I know it's not well, on that, your that's property. That's uh, outside of okay the property. That's actually considered an alley, you know, and uh, just south of that is the backyard of the residents that are on Northeast 20th Street. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? Do we have a motion on item 9A? Move for approval. Second. second. Motion and a second. Cast your votes. The motion passes unanimously. Thanks. Um, on Moving on to item 9B. This is uh, B1 is an amendment to the master design statement. And item 2 is uh, the ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval um, at 3301 Northwest 63rd Street, rezoned from O2 General Office and R1 single family to SPUD 1045. And this is in Ward 2, Ed. We do have Susan Hardy Brooks here to speak about this. Okay. Susan, would you like to come forward? If you'd please give us your name and address for the record. Yes, Susan Hardy Brooks. 3304 Northwest 64th. Vice Mayor, City Council, men, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. I am a lifelong Oklahoma City resident and a proud one at that. I am uh, very proud of your service and of the work of our city government in recent years. Um, I am very concerned about the plans for the change of designation and the uh, technical technical specifications for the property. I am actually the next door neighbor to this property. Um, if you look at the diagram, I am exactly northwest, well, I'm exactly west of Dr. Korber's property. So he is my next door neighbor. Um, when we got notice of the last meeting, when you all were going to be voting on changes to this property, uh, I went next door and met with Dr. Korber. And he showed us specifically the changes that he was planning, walked us through the canopy and some of the other uh, revisions he was going to make. And we asked him specifically if he had plans to move the fence. And he said no. He said he had no plans to move the fence. We asked again because there were stakes placed out near the street uh, what the purpose of those stakes was and he said that was just part of the surveying of the property uh, that he might move the shrubs that are now the border fence border but that there were no plans to extend the parking lot or change the fence line. 
So I did not come to the last city council meeting when this was first heard. Uh, about a week ago, I pulled into my driveway after work and two of my neighbors were out looking at the uh, property next door and the stakes. They came over and spoke with me. I believe they addressed you at the last council meeting when this came up before it was deferred. Um, at that time, they told me that the plans were to extend the fence line and I was shocked and disappointed. So basically from my front yard, right now I have a view of Independence Charter Middle School in the park. And now it will be the equivalent of having a six foot stockade fence in my front yard at my property line. Um, so if you just picture living in your neighborhood and your next door neighbor's putting a stockade fence six feet tall in front of your, in the front yard. Um, so I am asking for another deferment today. I would like to meet with the, with Dr. Korber and with the architects to see if we can make further revisions. Uh, they have brought a modification today that I got to see last night about 9 p.m. Um, I'm still not satisfied with the distance of the stockade fence that will impede my view, um, that will block half of my front yard, um, and that will, I am afraid, really impact my property value. It's a very lovely neighborhood. I bought the home about a year and a half ago, and um, it's difficult having a a surgery center next door to me already, but it would really change the complexion of our neighborhood and specifically the property values of my home. Thank you. Ed, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's a little frustrating because, you know, we, we deferred it and we were going to have the meeting and then I, I'm getting emails saying that these meetings took place and that an agreement had been reached. So I'm thinking today that, that the neighbors met. Now, this is this is their property. I mean, in in my mind, they can do what they want on the property. They it, have it, to change the designation. It is right now designated single family residential, and so they have to change. You all have to change the designation of the property to, a spud. to spud. So they do not currently have the right to alter. The property in that way. So this meeting that took place in the last week, you didn't attend that meeting? I did not. I knew a meeting was going to happen. I was not invited to the meeting and it was not a formal meeting with residents of the neighborhood. I believe the architect met with the two gentlemen that spoke at the last city council meeting. Dr. Corber was well aware of my concerns about the fencing he was either untruthful with me or he did not know when we met that he was going to be extending that fence line in the manner he has uh, decided to extend it. And so this, this modification that was agreed upon in, in that meeting that you didn't attend but that you, I guess, saw yesterday says... What? I saw the plans last night when I asked one of my neighbors to send. I think he received the drawing from the architect late last evening. What? So I've had no opportunity to have any dialogue with the architect or Dr. Korber, and I did not come to the last meeting because he quite dishonestly stated that he was not extending the fence. Well, what would, what would you guys do? May, may I ask a question? Yeah. Could we enlarge the picture a little bit more focusing on the home? Uh, okay. Yeah, right there. So may I ask you just a couple of questions? Sure. Do you have, have you had problems with the fact that it's, it's now uh, a business, a surgery center? I mean, uh, it looks like the only way you can enter it is off of Independence or 63rd, so it doesn't seem to create additional traffic, say, for your street, does it? There have been no traffic problems. Um, Dr. Korber has been a good neighbor. Uh, the only issue I've had is that 
my bedroom is literally right across the fence from their dumpsters and a couple of mornings a week at 6 a.m. Uh, the trash is picked up. But other than that, I've had no issues. Okay. And many times when we have issues related to zoning, the people who are against it say, we want more, uh, we want six feet uh, fences, stockades. We don't want to see that. But you're saying you don't want the fence to extend out, say, to the street. Is that your concern? Exactly. That's my exact concern. So you can see the front facing side of my home, which faces 64th, mm -hmm. and you can see the shrubs that currently there are some brick columns and right. shrubs across. Yeah. It's, it's not invasive. It's not bothersome. Um, what they're proposing to do is instead of the, the brick and the shrubs, uh -huh. to build a six-foot stockade fence that will go most of the way, Out almost to the, to the curb of my, <laughs> yes. Is, is there a reason, Ed, did they mention why they felt like they needed to take the fence out to the street? David, I it, think is, the applicant may be here. Oh, if okay. We wanna, is, it, okay. is the applicant or a representative of the applicant here? All righty, maybe you could answer some of these questions for us. Yeah, I mean, if that's Was that all right, Ms. Hardy Brooks? Not to let the fence go forward, that would seem like an easy fix. Okay. Could, could we allow the applicant to come forward? Yes, Ms. Brooks, absolutely. Thank you very much. Mark Ferris, 2933 South Bryan Avenue. I did meet with the two neighbors that live basically directly across the street last Thursday, and they made a request for some changes that after the builder and the business owner reviewed those, he agreed to make those changes. Those changes were put on this plan that's up above us and sent to uh, the two gentlemen that I met with, as well as the owner, as well as the city council office on Friday of last week. Um, I was not aware that there were any other protesters to this. This is the first I've heard of this. The plan has been since the original submittal with SPUD to extend the parking to the north. I cannot speak to conversations that Dr. Corber may or may not have had with anybody. Um, as far as the change that was proposed when I met with the neighbors last week, there is a hedgerow that extends along the common property line out approximately, I'm going to say about 14 feet from the edge of his existing parking lot. And it was decided with the neighbors that if we could pull the fence back to line up with the hedgerow that is along that com common property line that they would be satisfied with that. They do want a site proof fence because they live directly across the street and they would view the parking lot. Um, so they would like the six foot stockade fence as well as the plan is to landscape along that the fence line um, the two stakes that that the uh, were mentioned those are the property line stakes at the right of way which is approximately 13 feet south of the curb line the changes that were proposed is the fence will be then approximately another 11 foot south of that so the stockade fence is at parallel 64th street will be approximately 21 feet south of the curb line and so from the fence to the curb of 21 feet will either be grass or landscaping. Right. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not following this. How difficult would it be if the fence... So you're saying you'd like to have the fence running north and south to extend north up to where the fence running east and west? Yes, sir. And that would be approximately 14 feet from where it exists today. Okay. But is that still covered, let's use that word, covered by the shrubs and, and trees and bushes? Or will it extend past where the, can we go back to the Google picture? It's wonderful that we have Google to look at now, isn't it? <laughs> yes.
So those shrubs, how far further north are we extending the parking lot? Can you tell me that? 14 feet. Those trees that are showing on Google, um, north of those trees are some short shrubs. And I'm going to guess that they s extend vertically three or four feet. Mm -hmm. They're not anywhere near. They don't, as, as she mentioned, she has a view of the parking lot to the east and the school beyond. Um, that wouldn't obscure that view, the shrubs that are there. Well, if, if that's an issue, what about this? I mean, I'm not a, what if you, instead of a six foot stockade fence, had like a five foot wrought iron fence with the shrubs, you know, accompany that. You could still look out your window and see things uh, and it wouldn't be disruptive to the appearance, I wouldn't think. It, the SBUD was written with a, with a six foot stockade yeah, site can I, I just fence, and that's kind of a standard. On one that. clarification is that the staff recommendation, they had three recommendations. One is that you could only enter off of Independence with one, there could only be one entrance uh -huh. for cars. Right. The second is that the sidewalk on 63rd had to be maintained and, re and maintained, uh -huh. retained and maintained. Yeah. The third was that you had a six foot wood site proof fence um, in, in the back or in the front, whichever. So that was the staff's recommendation, is that a six-foot wood site-proof fencing along the street right away of Northwest 64th Street shall be required. Well, I understand. I'm just saying, given the activity, it's not like it's a manufacturing plan or something that's a little bit, uh, right. uh, you know, difficult to look at. It's just a parking lot. So just put in five-foot high shrubs with a wrought iron fence be done with it. What do you think of that? I mean, I an ornamental fence. There actually is an ornamental fence along that with with the shrubs. Those those shrubs are red red tip patinas, and it's, and most of them have died back and are dying, which is not uncommon for that plant variety. Um, as far as swapping out the six foot stockade site proof fence for an ornamental fence. I don't see that as, as an issue. However, so, the property owners across the street might have a different opinion. And that's what I was wondering is, uh, so you're able to get a concession with the neighbors across the street. Wasn't that based on the six foot site proof? Yes, sir. Thank you. So what, she's asking you for another deferral. Yeah. Ms. Hardy Brooks, would, would an ornamental fence rather than a stockade fence be acceptable? That would be helpful. My preference would be that the fence not extend um, that far into the front yard of my house, regardless of the height. Right now, you can see that the front of my house lines up with the uh, end of the parking. And if the fence, regardless of how high, moves, out, moves north 14 feet, you can imagine what that does to my front yard and um, having fencing, you know, literally in my front yard. Very unusual. So right now you don't see it because the setback lines up with the front of your house, essentially. Right, right. But by pushing and it out And there is feet. no fence there. There are brick columns and the shrubs. Uh, but there is no wrought iron in between the brick columns currently. Um, that's the reason I'm requesting a deferment. I think as a courtesy and as a good neighbor that I should have been given an opportunity to meet with the architect and with the neighbors, and I was not given that opportunity. So um, rather than taking time of the city council today, I would prefer the deferment and an opportunity to renegotiate with Dr. Korber and my neighbors. Is there anything time sensitive about this? And are you concerned? 
He's not here. Applicant. Ed, are you are you Are you amenable to, one, I'm, and I really appreciate your patience. I appreciate you meeting with the neighbors and doing everything that we asked of you two weeks ago. Would, are you amenable to another deferment to meet with her and talk about the... Property me, has been um, a surgery center for over 20 years in this exact configuration. Um, it is a state licensed surgery center, so not only do we have to comply with the changes in the zoning, but we also have to comply with the state health department. And they are inquiring as to why it seems to be taking so long, which is understandable, uh, but we'll certainly defer for two weeks if that's the council's pleasure. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to move forward, but I mean, in deference to you, I mean, they're going to do a second uh, deferment. So let's, I mean, I would move for a deferment and come back in two weeks and hopefully you guys can talk about the type of fencing and we can bring this to a conclusion. Is there a second on the deferral? Second. Ready? All those in favor, cast your votes. And the vote passes unanimously. Thank you. That would be, that'll be June 5th okay. is the date, okay? Thank you guys very much for the discussion. And can, can, Item. Can I, I'm sorry, Meg. Can, I, can we have the other two gentlemen also in that meeting or anybody else that might have? Because, because it sounds, okay. Okay, moving on. Item 9C is an ordinance on final hearing that establishes a reserved parking space for the physically disabled on the west side of North Hudson uh, um, and Northwest 6th Street. This is in Ward 6. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Catch your votes. Passes unanimously. Moving on to uh, item uh, 9D is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here in the audience hoping to hear or m make any remarks on the dilapidated structures? Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Cast your votes. The motion passes unanimously. Item 9E is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on unsecured structures? Second. second, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. That passes unanimously. Item 9F uh, is a public hearing regarding abandoned buildings. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on abandoned buildings? We have a motion. Second. Is there a second? Motion and a second. Cast your votes. And that passes unanimously. Item 9G1 is a public hearing, and G2 is the resolution adopting an amendment to the fiscal year 2018 budget for court administration and training. This was a, a presentation given by Doug Dollar two weeks ago, and, and uh, that was done at introduction. So this is the public hearing and the resolution approving the budget amendment. Second. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, item 9H is a resolution adopting Bike Walk OKC, which is our comprehensive bicycle and pedestrian master plan. And um, Aubrey McDermott is here to give us a presentation. Uh, well, she and, and uh, John Tankard. Yes, good morning, Vice Mayor and good Council. Good morning. Uh, we are happy to bring forward the product of several years of work to create our city's first comprehensive pedestrian and bicycle master plan called Bike Walk OKC in the theme of our comprehensive plans named Plan OKC. Um, one of the major themes of Plan OKC, one of the big ideas, was to provide transportation options for our community. We have a transportation element of that plan that made several recommendations. One was to create a destination-based priority bike network. One was to improve trail connections and develop a major pedestrian system plan. So this plan is a product of the recommendation of Plan OKC, and I think City Council is also familiar with one of your council priorities to develop a transportation system that works for all residents. 
That council priority further states to become more pedestrian friendly and cyclist friendly through better planning, design, and construction of complete streets, sidewalks, and trails. So this master plan is the guide to help us get there. The, proje the project itself um, incorporates and supersedes several plans that have been developed over the past many years, including the Trails Master Plan of 1997, the Bicycle Transportation Plan of 2008, the MAPS 3 Sidewalk Plan of 2012, and components of our Downtown Development Framework Plan. So as you can imagine, piecing all of the work that was done in these plans together into one comprehensive plan is a great single source of information. Um, the next slide talks about our public participation process, which began in 2015. As you know, anytime the planning department does a planning process, we have a, a multitude of options for the community to participate in that plan. We did have a steering committee that was developed with multiple partners. We conducted resident surveys. Uh, held multiple public meetings, went out to different community events to get as much feedback and input as we could from the community, and also placed the plan online for an extensive public review and comment period. Our partners on our steering committee, you can see some of the logos from the different partners, um, consisted of public, private sector, and nonprofit organizations. And the survey that we conducted of the community, this is kind of a, an interesting statistic in that when you don't do a statistically significant survey sample, you rarely get responses from every single zip code in Oklahoma City. However, the bicycle planning process was of interest to everyone, even in the far reaches of our community. We received over 1,700 responses, and you can see by the color code the density of responses coming from each of the zip codes in Oklahoma City. And the key survey findings from this survey were that less than 10% of the people who took the survey said that the conditions of our bicycle and um, pedestrian facilities was less than satisfactory. But over 90% felt that it was a very important thing for the city to work on. And the reasons people cited for not being able to walk and cycle across Oklahoma City was the lack of connectivity to the system, maybe traffic and safety reasons, um, interaction with vehicles and just the infrastructure itself. And the goals of Bike Walk OKC are very simple, that walking and cycling is safe. The second goal is that more people are walking and cycling for transportation and recreation as well. And that neighborhoods are connected to the places they need to go, like jobs, public transit, commercial districts, schools, and parks. And the last goal is that we can remove the barriers that prevent people from walking and cycling to those destinations they need to get to. So very simple goals. Um, I was going to ask John Tanker just to take you through the key elements of the Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan. He was the primary author for the plan, and he can also answer any specific questions you might have. So he's going to give you that overview. Thank you, Council. So I'm going to go through the uh, bicycle plan first and then move on to the pedestrian plan. So this first map shows the uh, facilities that existed in Oklahoma City for biking at the uh, beginning of the plan. We have you know, a great trail network that we've been improving over uh, the last few decades. We have more than 50 miles of on-street bicycle routes and about seven miles of on-street bike lanes. And, so, and this map shows the long-range plan um, with alignments that we identified as, um, as potential uh, facilities for cyclists on street as well as off street for trails and um, into neighborhoods and around um, natural features like our lakes. So in order to achieve that, uh, that map, we actually broke it into uh, these big projects, these component plans. And I'm going to go through each of these really quickly just to kind of show you the conceptual uh, reasoning for the uh, locations we chose. So the Grand Boulevard obviously historically uh, wrapped the city in a green belt and over time it became disconnected um, but through the last couple of decades we've been putting trails along it and there are only a few small gaps missing that um, we, ha we have identified and uh, created projects for so that we can complete this loop so that cyclists, pedestrians, any trail user can uh, make their way all the way around the city. Uh, to to enhance that, uh, we also are looking at, or uh, we also propose crosstown connections. So this is the idea of an east-west and north-south spine through the city that go through some of our densest 
uh, residential areas and provide access to and from public transit, parks, schools, and commercial districts. Um, as far as trails, like I said, we've uh, made great progress on trails and we uh, see the same happening in um, other cities around the metro area. And so this plan calls for creating connections to and from those other trail networks in the region. In areas of the city where there is not uh, much capacity on street to accommodate on street bicycle facilities, we are looking at neighborhood greenways, taking advantage of stream corridors um, so that uh, areas of the city further out in the outskirts can also have bicycling, whether it's for recreation or transportation to and from the places they need to get to. And the final component plan for the bike plan is uh, seeking to achieve that fourth goal of uh, making barriers crossable. And so we identified key barriers and um, are proposing bridges in these locations, much like the one that uh, was approved in the 07 bond uh, across the Northwest Expressway, which these renderings are from. Now I'm going to jump into the pedestrian plan. And similar to the bicycle plan, it's uh, composed of component plans. Uh, kind of grouped into two categories, the pedestrian priority areas and then more targeted approaches outside of uh, these areas, uh, looking at access to schools, public transit, and parks, as well as uh, filling in the gaps in downtown. This map shows the sidewalk, existing sidewalk network in Oklahoma City. And you'll see that there's um, kind of a, a missing ring of sidewalks in the city. So that's been a big focus of this plan is uh, how can we extend that network out to areas that could become walkable? And so this is the this map shows the component plans. In the red, you have your pedestrian priority areas. Um, and then we show schools, parks, and transit priority locations around the city. So you can see that uh, while it's targeted, it does have a broad uh, coverage of the city. Plan OKC gave us priorities in terms of uh, prioritizing pedestrian projects, and that included responsive population, so thinking about the people in the community that this plan will serve best. Um, and then looking at connections to schools and parks, our commercial districts, and making sure the neighborhoods are connected and taking advantage of existing networks. So the pedestrian priority areas um, is a concept in this plan that it seeks to uh, make areas that we uh, deem eminently walkable, walkable, putting the infrastructure that's missing in there, creating a network that connects residents to uh, places like schools, the, uh, to shopping, to recreation, to church, places like that. And this map shows uh, the 10 pedestrian priority areas we identified. This process is built into the plan so that as the plan is updated in the future, new pedestrian priority areas can be identified. Access to schools, we want to create an environment that's safe for children and families to, to walk to their neighborhood schools. These are great opportunities for people to be physically active with the facilities that exist and um, you know that applies to both children and adults could we go back one slide real quick sure thanks and this map shows our initial prioritization which was looking at how many people live within a walkable distance of a school and so we've identified our top 20 and are using that to start prioritizing uh, pedestrian projects for schools around the, the city. Similarly, we looked at access to public transit. We want to make the pedestrian component of public transit convenient, safe, and dignified. And we worked hand-in-hand uh, -hand with uh, COTPA, our transit agency, to identify the best locations around the city. And so we, uh, we arrived at a top 20 location just to sort of get us, get us started with um, you know, a list that we can work with. How is the, graduation? the next one is access to park parks, and similarly, we want to facilitate uh, movement to and from these locations. Great place for our citizens to be, or our residents to be physically active. This map shows uh, data that we gathered in partnership with the OU College of Public Health as well as the UCO College of Environmental Health. We actually had students go out and uh, inventory all of the pedestrian infrastructure assets around these locations so we can know exactly what's missing and turn that into a project. In the same way that we prioritize the top 20 for park or uh, for schools and transit, we did that for parks. And the final uh, component plan of the pedestrian plan is downtown. Um, with all of the momentum behind Project 180 and the streetcar and all of these things, there are some gaps that 
uh, can still be filled in to further enhance the, the new development and public investment that's ongoing. And so the plan identified every missing link in downtown and um, organized those into projects. And I'm going to hand it back over to Aubrey to talk about implementation. Thanks. The last chapter of the implementation plan is basically just um, calling out the projects and then the sources of funding that can help us implement this plan, fortunately, have already uh, been established in the 2017 GEO bond, plus the Better Street Safer City sales tax. We have received several federal grants to implement sidewalk and bicycle infrastructure. So these sources of funds are, will be leveraged to help us implement this plan over time. The plan itself is meant to be reevaluated and be flexible and have iterations as we go into the project development so that if there are engineering concerns with those streets, we can go back and evaluate the best type of facility and location for those projects. So this is great news that we do have funding to help us right off the bat start to implement our pedestrian bicycle master plan. And we're happy to answer any questions you might have. I, I have a few questions. I, I mean, I love the goals of this plan and, and it's clear you guys have put some great work into this. Um, I do have some concerns that I know there are a couple areas that I know of that I think need help. Now, I could be mistaken and maybe they aren't prioritized. Maybe they're only prioritized in my mind. But uh, so if we approve this plan, when I come back to you and say, hey, I need some help in a certain area that I know is underserved, is the answer going to be it's not part of this plan? Well, we, we use the prioritization methodology in this plan to highlight the greatest needs, and we would certainly evaluate whatever project came forward from the community or council to determine if those needs rise to the level of priority of funding. Um, the Better Street Safer City Board has been reviewing those prioritization criteria for this plan. Mm -hmm. And so any project that moves forward would be placed kind of in that, in that view. And for example, I think in your ward, there might be some locations where you have destinations, you're trying to connect people to schools. Those would certainly be brought through that process to evaluate how many people are needed, how far the connection is needed, and for consideration for Better Street Safer City funding. Thank you. Aubrey, I have some comments that I think follow along with Todd's uh, just a bit, which are, first of all, thank you for this. It's a fantastic plan, and I really appreciate you reviewing all of the steps that we took to get here. It's obviously very well thought out, and I certainly appreciate that, along with all of the collaborations and the outreach that went into putting this together. But I, I do need to share that in the last couple of days, I have had some concerns expressed, uh, particularly about E.K. Gaylord and the amount of traffic um, on that street and the speed at which it moves. And I hope you know that I certainly appreciate that a big part of this plan was designed to slow traffic down and create a more pedestrian and bike friendly traffic. But, um, and I think you mentioned this, so this may be a redundant question, but I would like to ask um, if we approve this today, that we recognize that this is a, still a work in progress and that while the framework is there, that we take a look at some of the specific concerns, particularly as it relates, I think, maybe Gaylord to parking as much as to the bike lane situation. That is how the plan is developed. It's developed as an identification of corridors that can help connect destinations. So if through the design process of a certain street or a roadway, the safest mechanism to put pedestrian or bicycle infrastructure on that roadway cannot be achieved, then we can move that to a different roadway that's more suitable for that facility type. The plan gives guidelines for what is a safe facility based on the speed of traffic, the number of cars on a street. So the plan's ultimate goal is to provide a safe and connected system. So the system plan itself is not locked into stone, and there's a caveat on that map that says subject to design and engineering. Great. And I know that Eric's been working hand in hand with this to assure that the engineering is up to speed. No pun intended. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> but that the engineering is, you know, accurate and achieves everybody's goals. But I just would like to have that on the record that we're going to be willing to look at that. Thank you. 
I've got one more question. Thanks, Councilman Sawyer, for making me think. Tinker Air Force Base is the biggest employer in Oklahoma City, right? And I, I don't see a whole lot of connectivity around Tinker Air Force Base other than some walking trails. What kind of plan do we have to help make that a more of a, a green area with housing for Boeing and Tinker Air Force Base personnel, as well as connectivity where, you know, currently over there, you can go to Choctaw, Shawnee, or mm -hmm. Northwest Oklahoma City, Southwest Oklahoma City. Is there something that we have in the future that we think will help minimize that traffic? Okay. I'm going to let John answer that question. So we, ha we had um, input uh, quite a bit from Boeing. They have a lot of uh, bicycle commuters in that area. And um, with the Draper Trail going in, there's a lot of uh, thought going into how to better connect that area. So on-street facilities, um, targeted uh, sidewalk locations, as well as uh, trail connections that would go through uh, the area where Tinker and Boeing are, would connect people to the downtown as well as to Lake Draper. So we, we have partnered uh, with them on this, and they have a, an excellent commuter program that um, has really taken leadership as far as uh, long long range cycling commuting uh, in the community goes. That's some pretty long range cycling if you're driving from Draper to downtown. I get busy driving my truck that far. Right. <laughs> yeah. busy. Uh, any other thoughts though on like housing in that area so that we're not worried about how to make that long commute better, but to minimize that commute for the city's biggest employer? I, I think that there's always um, speculation and activity that are happening over there for housing. We've had several uh, requests to rezone to provide multifamily housing for that workforce. So I think that's continuing to grow. Good. Todd, I do also want to put a plug in for the Regional Transit Authority discussion that's going on in both um, Midwest City and Dell City are participating in those conversations. And it is also long term, but we are talking about um, better opportunities for whether you call it light rail or commuter rail or whatever it might be, but serving Tinker as well. So are the, I also have concerns about EK Gaylord, and I'm wondering, are, are those, are, has that been removed, or is that just still under study, or what, what is the, I know that you have, you now have corporate pressure to alter what, what the city had previously thought or had come up with for EK Gaylord? And have we, I guess I'm wondering, have we succumbed to that pressure? Or are we just going to study? Um, you know, what, where are we? To, in my mind, I hope we resist that corporate pressure because we are making a major investment in the Oklahoma City Boulevard. That, you know, gets people in and out and then it gets them to the highways, I-235 and 44, and then that moves people quickly. But this is the street that you're putting a transit hub on that, you, that needs to be truly multimodal, not just for the automobile. So you have the streetcar going there. One day you might bring the buses back, which would be appropriate. You have pedestrians. You have, one of, you have probably one of the most dangerous areas for pedestrians you know, over the last few decades. You have a, a hole in that, uh, I can't, I can't in that overpass, so you have a, a parking garage over there, and you just have masses of pedestrians walking through that that hole in the in the wall to the parking garage, to the Santa Fe parking garage. It's there's no they're just jaywalking across EK Gaylord. Uh, that that has to be one of our highest priorities for pedestrians. That's because they don't walk, you know, they just go through that hole in the wall right by that surface parking lot on the on the east side of Gaylord, jaywalk across. Gaylord to the Santa Fe parking garage. That's got to be a high priority. Um, moving pedestrians through there, right next to your transit hub, to me seems like one of the highest priorities for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for the streetcar, for the buses. And I just hope that we don't succumb to this corporate pressure to once again prioritize the automobile far above everything else. We had a lot of thought went into how to make EK Gaylord better for all these modalities, and now we have this last minute pressure, uh, and, and I just, I hope that we resist, and we make it truly multimodal, and we, and we make it a 
really functioning transit hub. But to do that, you're not going to be able to just prioritize the automobile and have them move as fast as possible uh, so that people can get to their suburban homes. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that comment. Thank you. Okay, I've got some comments. Mine are a little bit more optimistic or favorable. I think there's been dramatic improvement with sidewalks and walkability and uh, rideability, especially in the suburban areas. Now, there's still areas that we can work on, but in the last 10 years, especially in Ward 5, when we see sidewalks go in, it really changes the dynamics of that neighborhood. You see, you automatically see more people walking and just getting around. So I would encourage continuing to do that. Uh, I would like to say that I believe there's a little bit of a distinction between, especially from a biking standpoint, between out in the suburban areas where uh, traffic speeds tend to increase and the uh, experience of the drivers dealing with bicyclists begins to decline. They're just not as used to it compared with the downtown area where people anticipate uh, to encounter bikers uh, and they're just more, uh, I think, cautious and aware of the potential for bikers. So in areas such as May Avenue, which I ride up and down on, I think uh, and Kenny, maybe we could uh, get this somehow in the ordinances, that it's okay to get onto the sidewalks as opposed to having to ride your bike out in the street along certain high-speed uh, arterial streets. Because technically, we're not supposed to bring our bikes onto the sidewalks. Is that true? That's correct. And so maybe we could put something in the ordinance that provides an exception if there's no bike lanes or we feel like the uh, widths of the uh, lanes on arterial streets such as May Avenue are so, uh, are designed to where it really, at least with older people, uh, a heightened level of worry when you're on your bike. Yeah, Councilman, there's a section in the plan that r makes recommendations for the type of facility and the design of the facility based on those conditions. So as we move forward and build bicycle infrastructure, we would only select corridors and facility types that complement each other for the greatest safety. And, and those, those conditions would have to be evaluated for each roadway type. So if, for example, an on-street bike facility needed to jog up to a trail-type facility off-road, that would be part of the engineering and design for that project. But uh, we certainly are very aware of those dynamics, and we want to make biking as safe and easy as possible for our residents. Right. But still, I mean, going back to Kenny, mm -hmm. excuse me, Aubrey, uh, I do think it would be uh, a good idea if we would consider allowing that as an exception. And I'm not opposed to getting off your bike and walking it, especially if you're encountering somebody who's walking on those sidewalks. I think that's only appropriate. But again, especially in the suburban areas where there's really not as much provisions being made for uh, biking on the main arterial streets, that it would not be a, uh, we would not be breaking the law. Because I know of some people who do that already. We can prepare, we can prepare an ordinance amendment. You probably need some study on the, the safety aspect of it. That's probably why they keep bikes off of the sidewalks. and I anticipate that will only continue in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I would make a motion to uh, uh, approve the plan. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Are there any other comments from council members or questions? We have a citizen who signed up to be heard on this item, and that is Joe Beth Hammond. Perhaps Joe Beth is not here still. Okay, well that is fine. Uh, she said she wanted to speak in favor. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. The resolution item 9H passes unanimously. 
Moving on to item 9I1, resolution adopting the Community and Neighborhood Enhancement Program Project Implementation Plan. And I believe uh, there is a presentation. There is a presentation. It's kind of a big step today, uh, uh, kicking off this plan. And Eric Winger is here with Aubrey to do this. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we're very pleased today to present um, a lot of months of work um, following the Better Street Safer City initiatives that really kicked off and uh, in full force with the first um, advisory board meeting being held in January. So what you're going to see today is the presentation of the implementation plan, the first implementation plan that they're recommending to you as council for projects to proceed. Um, the program itself is, is jointly managed. Obviously, public works and planning have a vital role in making sure that just like by OKC OKC initiatives are, are anticipated, um, but also a lot of close work with the budget and finance offices, the sales tax collections continue to come in monthly. Um, we've we put this program together and the plan that you have before you, so each of you should have a copy. Um, it does look like this. Um, it has multiple tabs that are included in it as well. We're gonna make this available online, also at OKCGov following its approval. Um, but this is really a format that you should be somewhat familiar with. It, it follows a similar form from the MAPS-3 implementation plan where it outlines the different projects. And I'm gonna go through some of those sections here pretty quickly. Included is an executive summary. Um, what you'll find in the executive summary to the implementation plan is just that history with the vote, um, the temporary tax being 27 months, the establishment of the advisory board, um, and then again a note that the collections began January 1st. Now you're going to find also in the executive summary we have the funding breakdown. This was the, the model that was presented by the City Council identifying the five major program types, the street resurfacing, the street enhancements, the sidewalks, the trails, and of course the bike infrastructure, and the amounts that are anticipated based on that $240 million overall collection. When we look at the departmental involvement, and I mentioned um, public works and planning, but there's a number of other departments that are also involved in the program. Finance and budget, municipal counselor's office. We're also looking to engage the MAPS office with a lot of the implementation that they were able to successfully do in MAPS 3 with the trails and the sidewalk program. So as we get ready to identify trail and sidewalk locations, we're going to have a lot of the same city staff working on those projects as well. What you're going to find inside the plan, and as we look at the project breakdown, you're going to find that there's street resurfacing being one of the five project category types, and it's the one that's been partially um, placed into the program. It's the one that we have the most information. It has a lot of the information that was developed in the 2017 bond program. And there's three sections that are included here. You're going to have the early start projects. And you might be familiar with these. These are the 16 projects that were approved by the City Council in late February, allowing us to start that planning and contracting process to initiate some of that work. The value of those is $18.9 now what's also included in this plan is the next round of projects that's being recommended to you by the advisory board. 41 additional arterial projects valued at 22.1 million and three residential projects valued at 13.8 million. So with the approval of the plan today, this would bring the total up to 60 projects and $54.8 million. Now the plan today is anticipated to be that six month plan. And so one of the goals of this plan is that it be updated periodically, approximately every six months you will find that there are some other sections that do not have projects in them yet because we're still working to develop those. The planning department with the approval of course today of Bike Walk OKC is able to implement that with the Better Street Safer City initiative, making sure that locations selected for sidewalks and trails are compatible with, with this new adoption. So when you look at the streets enhancement section, you're going to find that there's going to be projects recommended that are a mix of improvements, vehicular, pedestrian, bicycle, trees landscaping, and amenities. And these project worksheets, the actual establishment of the projects themselves and the budgets will be included in a future amendment. So again, they're not in the book today because the advisory board has not yet received all that information and, and sorted through that information. But we anticipate that in approximately the next few months with the next plan amendment. The same would go for sidewalks, pedestrian project pr priorities, including connectivity to schools, networks, neighborhood revitalization, and commercial district. Again, those project worksheets, once those projects are prioritized, the list is developed, will be brought back to the City Council for approval. Trails is the same, expanding new trail networks. There's also been an ongoing discussion at the advisory board level about improvements to the existing trail system. So not only would new trails be incorporated, but it would be enhancements and upgrades potentially to some of the existing trails networks. Parks Department is very quickly 
um, organizing a lot of the information, doing some additional studies, and so that information is also being presented to the advisory board as well. And then the last of the project categories, the bicycle infrastructure, talking about the expansion of the bicycle network and uh, new amenities. Uh, these project worksheets will forward as well. This next section of the implementation plan is going to be project updates. The one thing that we're not certain at this time is the exact timeline for the implementation. This is being funded as of today as a pay-as-you-go, so we are working to expend the money very quickly as it's received. But as we get the other project categories with project worksheets approved um, by the council, we'll be able to establish a general timeline on how we're going to accomplish all the construction over the 27-month collection period. Um, generally speaking, as checks are received and as funds are available, we hope to have the approvals in place to immediately issue work orders, engaging architects and engineers if necessary on projects, and going through that staff coordination to expedite the work. And then the last section in the, in the book is the appendices. Um, this is where you'll find, and of course this is a great resource being made available online, but it's also a resource for our advisory board, the history including the ordinance, the advisory board resolution, and then we also have the first financial summary that's included in the document as well. So here's the next steps. Next steps are following council's approval today, we would increase the number of street resurfacing projects that would allow us to then go past the early start projects with funds that are being collected this and future months to not slow the progress, being able to work with contractors currently under contract and issuing additional work orders for street resurfacing citywide. Now we're not going to overextend the expenditures of the street resurfacing projects. There's almost $168 million in total value in street resurfacing, but as the other project categories come online, that's where you're going to see us starting to blend the project implementation, and you'll see sidewalks and trails and bike lanes and streetscapes coming as well. We hope to be able to provide that updated plan in six months or less. So I'm going to stop here just for a moment, and this is going to summarize what's included in the plan that I just presented to you. Again, a plan that gives us the guidance from the staff's perspective with the council's approval to move very quickly ahead. Um, this second part of what I'm going to present to you is really just a status update on those 16 early start resurfacing projects that the council previously considered. I mentioned that the funding for these, um, which is valued at nearly $19 million, um, the projects were identified in, in late February. Um, we did get contracting in place with, with city contractors um, to get these organized, to get the prices validated, and we've actually issued the work orders on all 16 um, by the end of last month. Um, through the middle part of April, we actually were fully funded for, the, um, for those expenditures. So not only are the work orders issued, but the appropriations have been made and the funds are in place, um, ensuring that we can move forward quickly. You'll identify the ones that are in green. Those are the ones that are underway now and are beginning this month in May. Um, there are several that will begin in June, and you'll notice that there's one agreement that we're able to leverage some county assistance in doing a joint project um, for Southwest 29th Western to Shields with the county. These are some of the better street safer city um, signs that are going up at these locations. And so we, uh, we have started the implementation of, of signage in the field. This is also similar signage that you'll find for a lot of the 2017 bond projects. So I think one of the things that we recognize is that it's very difficult for a lot of our residents to tell the difference between a bond project or a sales tax project. So we're really combining those initiatives, better streets, safer city. We're identifying that you can get more information online at okc.gov. So we encourage those that might have questions to resource the city's website for additional information. And of course, the contact information for staff is there as well. And this is some of the work that's underway at Northwest 50th. And when we talk about resurfacing, there are some federal um, regulations that we have to follow. I wish it was as simple as just resurfacing the street. But one of the things that comes um, with the ADA um, laws that are in place is we are required to update corners and accessibility. So we are requiring updates to concrete infrastructure. This is going to be ramps. This is going to be some of the sidewalks. Now this does not mean that we must construct a sidewalk with the street. So I want to make that clear. If a sidewalk exists or a ramp exists that's non-compliant, we're required to upgrade that. So what you're seeing on, on 29th and what you're seeing on Northwest 50th is those projects are fully engaged and they're getting those concrete improvements done. The concrete, which is very much a part of the curb and gutter, has to be in place before we can actually perform the physical resurfacing. So on 29th, that work is wrapping up and they're getting ready to do the mill and overlay, but this is some of the new ramps that you see at some of the intersections there. You'll notice the tactile warning strips that are being placed. Again, those are ADA compliant, uh, making sure that when the project's completed, it is a complete project, not just from a city 
but also from a state and federal perspective as well. These are some more of those examples of those completed concrete um, portions of the project which are all wrapping up on Southwest 29th. This is Portland Avenue, it's also underway. 44th to 29th, this is some of that concrete re-ramping work that's underway, and again, you'll see the tactile warning strips that, again, are a warning device for those before they enter into the intersection that they're actually leaving um, the sidewalk and entering the street. Another photo of Portland. And I believe this is our final one. And again, we upgrade, uh, upgrade a lot of the pedestrian signals at that time if those are required as well. So you would visit these sites today. This is what you can expect. These photos were taken just in the last week. Now, I note these just as to what you can expect. These are not early start projects, but these are projects that we've recently completed in just the last month. This is Southwest 44th. Again, a very similar project type, upgraded um, amenities. You'll see the street resurfaced and it recently restriped, but this is what you can expect on the 29th, the Portlands, the Northwest 50th, and the other early start projects in just the next few short weeks. The resurfacing itself only takes about a month. It's about a week of milling, there are some repairs that are done to that street. Then there's a week of resurfacing, and then there's the week of putting all the striping and some of the other components back in place. Now, barring bad weather, we're in that four to six week time period of completing these projects. This is another photo of 44th in its completed form and what you can expect um, with better streets, safer city, and a lot of the arterial resurfacing. This is Walker Avenue. Um, this one has not been striped yet, and the reason that you see some of the cones in the street, they're actually bringing those valve covers and those manhole lids up to the finished grade of the asphalt. Um, they have a concrete collar that goes around them to make sure that they're flush and that they're protected. The contractor there is just about wrapped up, and so the striping is expected later this week. This is where they're laying out the new crosswalks, and again, as we provide those accessibilities. Yes, it's all about resurfacing, but it's also the upgrades to the other amenities that are especially at those corners. So that's going to wrap up my update this morning. Um, so again, before you is an implementation plan for your consideration and approval. It's the first of many. Uh, we've got many months ahead. There's many more projects to come online. Again, this is about a six-month look ahead for the street resurfacing. As monies are collected in the next in several months into the summer, we, with your authorization, will launch into those additional 41 projects and, and continue to make improvements citywide. Um, I do want to compliment the council on your selection for the oversight members. They're, they're very engaged. They're very serious about taking this on, and, and uh, the board's been working great so far. So thank you for your uh, due diligence in getting good people on, on those boards. Great. Is there any more, anything else? Um, any comments from council on this? Um, certainly our gratitude to your teams and, um, and then the advisory board as well for all of their work. I, I would just echo keep up the good work. There's a lot going on out there and I've driven a lot of the, when you show the final product, I've driven a lot of those and it's fantastic. So, and I try not to complain about potholes and construction in the same breath. I always tell people pick one or the other. So <laughs> I would definitely pick construction over potholes. And thank you and your staff. Well, and we would reiterate, construction's inconvenient. There will be barricades, there will be temporary lane closures, but kind of one of the messages that I tried to relay last time is these are not widening projects. These projects don't take months and months. These projects are done very quickly with that temporary inconvenience, but hoping that some of the photos that we showed of the completed work um, will go a long way as we do a lot of miles of, of street in Oklahoma City. I, I think the citizens are really beginning to even in this early start, see some real improvements. So it's very exciting, Eric. Great. So I need a motion and a second for item 9I1. Got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then there's also item 9I2, which is a resolution approving allocation of better streets funds for projects recommended by the advisory board, uh, totaling about $35 million. Is there a motion for that? Motion and a second. Seeing any no further discussion, we'll cast our votes. Passes unanimously. Okay. Now we're moving on to nine, items 9, J, and K. These all relate uh, to Councilman John Pettis in Ward 7. Last week I received his resignation letter uh, from the council, which is effective May 31st. That triggers certain responsibilities on our part, which includes the uh, fulfillment of the position both on the short-term basis and a long-term basis, which is really two separate processes. 
Um, item 9J uh, accepts the resignation and also discusses our appointment of an interim council member. And if you see in the resolution, I think it is worth noting that we are uh, calling for applications to be submitted starting tomorrow through next Tuesday. We will then consider those. Uh, there is no timeline set for that, um, although we are obligated to complete our process by the end of about June. I think we all sense the urgency to move as quickly as we, as we can. Um, and so that is, that is item J, and maybe I'll stick with that for a moment. Are there any, uh, is there a motion? Okay, motion and a second for item 9J. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll cast our votes. That passes unanimously, and that leaves us with items 9K1 and 9K2. Now this relates more to the long-term uh, fulfillment of the Ward 7 vacancy. Uh, that calls for a uh, filing period in mid-June. There will be three days at which candidates may uh, file to fill the position for the next three years. Um, as, as the Ward 7 uh, current term is only a year in. And then we also would have an election in late August. Um, that's all set out here, August 28th. If necessary, if no candidate received a majority uh, of the total votes, there would be a, a general election. Some might call it runoff, but in the terminology of our ordinance, it is a general election on November 6th. Um, it is probably worth noting that the interim appointment is variable in its length depending on what happens on August 28th. The interim appointment would either uh, conclude soon after that or would last all the way till November if that second election is necessary. So the item K1 calls for the special election. Uh, item K2 notifies the election board of the special election. I would entertain a motion on item 9K1. David, can I ask? Two, yes. Two questions. Yes. One, one, if somebody was interested in that application, where would they find it? Great question. Uh, uh, why don't we let Francis handle that? And this is the application for the interim appointment. Yeah. Yeah, Councilman, it will be available online on OKC.gov at 8 o'clock in the morning, and hard copies will also be available in the city clerk's office, and we will email uh, applications if requested. And the, the deadline's the end of the day next Tuesday. Correct. Okay. Uh, May 29th at 5 o'clock. And if, while we're on that topic, we probably ought to ask you also, how would someone, where would someone get the materials if they wanted to run for the office? Uh, we have copies available for free of the Oklahoma City Charter, and I can also pr provide the state statute information okay. if requested. But a candidate packet of some kind for, for those wishing to run for the office, that's not something they get here? Uh, no. Okay. To file for candidacy would yeah. be at the Oklahoma Election Board on Lincoln okay. Avenue. Okay, all of that and they need to go And to those election. dates are June 13th, 14th, and 15th that they will file at the Oklahoma. So depending on your interest, you'd go to different places. If you're interested in the interim appointment, you need to come here to City Hall. If you're interested in running, you need to go to the Election Board. Correct. And they can call me in the City Clerk's Office, 297-2391, if they have any questions about the procedure. Okay. Is that so, second question is, what, what will these one and maybe two elections cost? Uh, I'm not sure the exact amount, of course, since it's just a ward uh, district, uh, it, it, it will be a lot less than a citywide election. But Councilman, I don't know the exact amount, but I can, I can get an estimate from the election board if you'd like. Like 50,000? Probably around. How is invoicing for that handled to us when there are other elections going on? In this case, the runoff election in August and the general election in November. Yes, uh, we do uh, split the cost with the other entities that are um, that are having elections on that day. However, the most expensive cost is the ballots, which we pay a full okay. uh, price for a ballot. Right. Any other questions on either K1 or K2? I forget, did we get a motion on K1? We need a second. <laughs> second. All right, we have a motion and a second on item K1, uh, 9K1. Any further discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We also have item 9K2. So this is uh, just the resolution notifying the election board of our elections. Um, 
Motion for that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Mayor, uh, the municipal councilor pointed out that I said the Oklahoma State Election Board, and that is incorrect. It's the Oklahoma County Election Board where they will be filed. Correct. Good, Good correction. Um, all right, moving on. We are on item 9L. Uh, this is a resolution authorizing the municipal councilor to confess judgment without admitting liability in the case of uh, Grisham and Rutledge v. City of OKC. Uh, Kenny, do we need any executive session? No. Then I would uh, entertain a motion. We have a motion and a second for 9L1. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9M. Resolution authorizing the municipal councilor to confess judgment in the case of Hurston v. City of OKC. Kenny, do we need an executive session? No. Then I would entertain a motion for item 9M1. Second. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9N, resolution authorizing the municipal councilor to confess judgment in the case of Neely v. City of OKC. Kenny, do we need executive session? No. Then I would entertain a motion on 9N1, the resolution. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Item 9O. Joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority authorizing Margaret McCall Love to represent Richard Mahoney in uh, Stewart v. City of OKC. Okay. And Kenny, we don't need executive session? Do not. All right, we've got a motion on the item. Second. A second. Uh, so this is the resolution of 901. Any discussion? Seeing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we are on item 9P, resolution authorizing Richard Smith and Brett Logan to represent uh, William City in the case of Stewart v. City of OKC. Kenny, do we need executive session? Do not. We do not, so I'll entertain a motion on uh, 9P1, the resolution. We've got a motion and a second. Seeing, any, seeing no discussion, we'll cast their votes. Passes unanimously. Moving on to 9Q, resolution authorizing Richard Smith to represent Vance Allen in the case of Stewart v. City of OKC. Kenny, do we need an executive session? No, sir. We do not, so I'll entertain a motion on 9Q1, the resolution. Who's the item? Got a motion and a second. Seeing no discussion, we'll cast our votes. Passes unanimously. Uh, now we are on item 9R. Are, and Kenny, we will need a uh, executive session on this uh, litigation with CUSAC Wholesale Meats Company, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, we've got a motion and a second on executive session. Uh, cast our votes. That passes unanimously, and so we will uh, leave that for the end of the meeting. After our other business, we will go into executive session. Item 9S. Uh, claims recommended for denial. Uh, Kenny, do we need executive session? No. We do not. Uh, any uh, discussion or motion? Got a motion and a second. Seeing no discussion, we'll cast our votes. Passes unanimously. Uh, item 10. We've made it to 10A. Claims recommended for approval. I do not believe we need an executive session here. Uh, I'll entertain a motion on, not, on 10A1 then. Okay, uh, motion in a second, seeing no discussion. Cast your votes, passes unanimously. All right, now we will return back. I understand that uh, we left aside item 7AX, joint resolution with the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust approving the allocation of GO bond proceeds in an amount of $1.7 million to provide job creation incentives uh, uh, for job creation economic development agreement with Amazon.com Services Inc. And uh, again, it's my understanding we did not consider this item or hear a presentation or anything, so we'll, we'll return to that now. Uh, and uh, Jim, I believe you have a presentation from Brent Bryant? We do. Yes, sir. Yes, Kent. Good morning, Council. Um, today, I want to just go over some brief um, facts related to the Amazon project. Um, 
for your review. Um, start with the first one. The project's located at 9201 South Portland. Um, project Amazon will lease a, a 640,000 square foot build, build to suit facility from a third party. Uh, the project requires a capital investment exceeding $140 million. That $140 million also includes $4.1 million worth of infrastructure, um, which we'll, I'll get into that in, in the next slide. As it relates to jobs, Amazon currently has around 39 full-time jobs in Oklahoma City. They anticipate creating a total of 1,750 jobs at the site with the annual payroll in excess of $45 million. Approximately 53 of those jobs will be full-time facility management positions. Uh, and Amazon has told us they considered various sites in the Midwest and Southern states for this project. The key terms with, the, with Amazon include uh, the creation of 53 new to market jobs at an average salary of around $60,000, investment of at least $40 million of private taxable uh, um, investment, which includes facilities, equipment, and the public infrastructure. The city will provide up to $1.7 million in performance-based incentives. Incentive will pay, be paid out over a three to seven year time frame. Um, this, this project, like I noted earlier, was, is for 1,750 jobs, but not all 1,750 jobs uh, qualify for our program, and uh, those 53 jobs do. And so, uh, but as a result of incentivizing those 53 jobs, it will result in 1,697 new jobs with an average wage of between $12 and $14 an hour, with a $129 million economic impact in the first two years, and the estimated local sales and property taxes will exceed $4.8 million in five years. The process, uh, I want to go through that. As, as we've mentioned before here, before this body, um, the Chamber of Commerce is, is kind of the gatekeeper of this program. They work with site selectors throughout the country and to try to recruit them to come to Oklahoma City. The Chamber started rep working with representatives from Amazon back in November of 2017. They consulted with staff along with the Kathy O'Connor at the Alliance and a recommendation of $1 million was uh, recommended to the project. Subsequent to that, and that was based solely on 50 jobs at $60,000 and $140 million worth of taxable investment. Amazon requested, subsequent to that, um, Amazon requested assistance for the public infrastructure. Um, if, you're, if you're familiar with Lariat Landing, um, a few years ago, the airport came in and redid most of Portland down to 104th. And, uh, what, they've, what they needed to do was they're going to extend 89th Street from Portland to the west towards the airport. They're going to also need turn lanes, dedicated turn lanes um, at that intersection of 89th and Portland. In addition to that, there's a decelerization lane that they anticipate they'll need on I-44 going south at 89th Street. And as a result of that, they're going to have to put traffic signals on both sides of I-44 along 89th Street. Um, we asked for a list of all of those infrastructure requirements that they were seeking our help with. Um, we worked with the public works director, the assistant public works director, identified those, and as a result of that, we identified certain uh, things that we believe were more regional that uh, we could help participate in. Uh, we identified about $1.4 million. It's roughly a few turn signals at 89th in Portland, and then the decelerization loan lane on I-44 along with the, the two uh, uh, traffic signals on both sides of, of the um, I-44. Um, and what we did is we offered to pay for half of that. Um, back in 2012, uh, this council, the Economic Development Trust, approved an amendment to the Strategic Investment Program to include funding for infrastructure. We formalized that. So we believe that fit within the uh, program. The key thing on the $700,000, they still have to create the jobs. They will fund it up front, and they will be paid as they create the jobs. Um, so, and they have to do those certain improvements. If they don't do those improvements, um, 
they would not be provided the $700,000. So it's very uh, important you know that. So um, the process, um, subsequent to providing them the recommendation for a million dollars, they did when they made their final application, actually um, increase it to 53, um, but we did not change anything on the million dollars and it stated a million. So the next steps would be with your approval today would be uh, the negotiation of an economic development agreement based on these key terms that are provided to you. And then we would, the earliest we could bring that back to the trust would be June 26th and then, or July 24th and then subsequently meetings with the city council. Uh, we anticipate them breaking ground next month along with, uh, with the completion in June of 2019. And we would not expect our first payment to them to occur until sometime in 2020. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a, I have a question. The economic impact number that you, that, that's always given here, is that a net impact or a gross impact? Do, do we, and basically the, what I'm meaning is, are we taking into account uh, net losses from, because, I mean, to, to say that there's just going to be 1,700 new people here having jobs, I mean, obviously those people are going to be moving from another job. Uh, and so do we count all of that? It's a or? gross number. It's a gross number. Okay, good. And um, I have no problem with the 700,000 because that is uh, them coming in contributing to the public infrastructure and we are we are contributing to it the the problem I do have is the is the million dollars and you know generally whenever I whenever we talk about these jobs incentives I don't like any of them um, and that's why whenever we went through the whole process through the bond project that I voted against the um, I, I get, against the uh, the economic um, economic development package as a councilman. I, I voted on it here. I voted against it as, as a citizen in, in the voting booth. Um, and the main reason for that is because I don't think businesses create jobs because of the incentives. I think they create jobs because they need more workers to produce more products and to provide more services. Um, and they get the incentives just because the incentives are there. But that's where I think the policy decision was made was at the uh, whenever we were discussing the, the bomb package. So the, the voters voted for it, and which is why I voted in favor of the last two that were on the consent docket, because I think that, I, I think that those were um, aligned with how we should incentivize it based on, uh, based on what we talked about. Just a few numbers. Um, for uh, CACI, we, we gave them $1.25 million for 550 jobs. Uh, that equates to $2,273 per job. Dura coatings, we gave them 100,000 for 49 jobs. That equates to $2,041 per job. Um, if you just take the million dollars and take that $700,000 out that we're uh, proposing to give to Amazon, that equates to $18,863 per quality job. So in the end, um, I'm, I'm probably going to vote for that unless something really changes my mind, but um, I'm, I'm probably going to vote against this, and that's the main reason why, is that I don't think that this aligns with the other two. And I know that it's because of the, uh, because of the other investments that they're making, but all those are private investments that they have to make anyway when they come here. I mean, they, they aren't going to be able to run their business how they want to run it without doing those things. So um, I, I really don't know why we're incentivizing that aspect of it, and because that is a very short-term um, gain that some other business could come in and do that as well. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that, that, that's my view on it, and um, I'll be done now. I think this is kind of a teachable pinata about everything that's wrong with economic incentives. And I think that this particular incentive package is one of the worst to come before us. It is basically, to me, the Stockholm Syndrome of economic development, where we pay 
eight times our average allocation per job, of, that's 32,000 for these jobs if you include the infrastructure, versus an average on all the other projects of 4,000 per job. We pay our tormentors, those who have denied paying sales tax to us over the years and decades, those who have cost us retail jobs, those who, who are going to come in and cost us more retail jobs, hurt our small businesses here in Oklahoma City, and we are paying them to eat everybody's lunch. There are a myriad of problems, starting with why did this, why so fast? Why are we hearing this today, 11 days after it was first publicized to the public, if it's not for the, the purpose of minimizing public discussion and public awareness about it? We, until I ask for a deferral, right, you got a red eye flight from Las Vegas because you and Kathy were at the shopping association meeting. There was not going to be you or Kathy or anyone from Amazon here today. Four days after the public heard about it, it was at the Economic Development Trust. Eleven days were here. The, the answer to Jim Roth at the Economic Development Trust about public transportation, Amazon likes this site because of, of bu bu bus service. There isn't any bus service to this site. So we're currently negotiating how we're going to get bus service to this site. Who's going to pay for it? Are we going to have to, we'd have to, you know, why not have that negotiated? You know, or are we going to have to increase, we'll have to increase the number of buses to get it to this site for these low wage jobs. Why not have that sorted out first? Why so fast? I mean, we had to, we had to delay till David got here to even have enough people. Uh, Mark's not here. Why, why so fast? The second thing is why sign non-disclosure agreements? My understanding is that you were required to sign a non-disclosure agreement that not only didn't let you talk about it three or six months ahead of time. That I understand. If you have, you know, if you have a, a big company that comes in, you don't want people speculating on land and driving up land prices and or another city competing. But here you had this going on the airport trust land, right? You're not going to have speculation. This is going on the airport trust. But your non-compete, what I heard you to say last week, is that it, it prohibited you from talking about this until it was released on the Economic Development Trust agenda that Friday afternoon. That to me is severe, far, it, uh, far more than is required, and serves only to suppress public discussion and deliberation and involvement in the process. And that's why you, just two weeks ago, when I asked you, when you were talking about the strategic investment program, I asked you, could this qualify? And you had to answer, uh, I think that's something that might qualify, rather than actually two weeks from now, it's all going to be wrapped up. Two weeks from now, we're going to be right back and it'll all be over. You couldn't answer that way because you had signed a non-disclosure. What, what would be wrong? That's a policy decision, right? That's the council allowing a city employee to sign a non-disclosure agreement that doesn't allow him to talk to anyone, including city council members, about it until four days before the vote. What would be wrong with the city council having a policy that you get this all wrapped up, you get, you get the, the agreement made, and then there's a minimum of 30 days before it comes before the council? I mean, that to me just seems, if nothing else, an improvement in the process, because this is just too fast, and these non-disclosure agreements are too extreme, and they serve only to protect these corporations from public scrutiny which has markedly increased because Amazon has done this over and over and over throughout the country. And Good Jobs First did a study in late 2016, and their efforts towards secrecy have increased after that study. In terms of the merits of the uh, award, it is clear that their business model originally was to locate these warehouses in select places where they didn't have to pay taxes. So they didn't create a nexus where they had enough of a physical presence to have to pay sales tax. Then as that started to change and states like Texas went after them and they started to have to pay to, uh, sales tax, they moved into the prime business model, which is where at a loss, they, they deliver services the same day, next day or even the same day. You cannot do that unless you have a physical presence in every major market. So what we're seeing is Amazon creating these fulfillment centers in every major metropolitan area in the United States. And this build, they build it 
not in the zip codes where you have the highest incomes, but right next to them and at airports. They're building an air hub in Louisville. They are building, they are going to try and compete with delivery, with UPS, FedEx, uh, eventually. So they have to be at the airport and near high, incomes, in, uh, high income zip codes, which is exactly what they're doing here. They are going to do this no matter what they are doing. Th this idea that they, that they proposed it to other states and cities around us, they're already doing it. They're already doing it in Dallas, in Tulsa. Where are they going to go if they don't go here? Where are they going to go to, to get same-day delivery to the people of Oklahoma City, the 1.5 million people in the metro area? Actually, each one of these fulfillment centers, we learned at the Economic Development Trust, has a 100-mile radius. So they service a 100-mile area. So you, so you do Tulsa, you do here. You're, you're done for Oklahoma. But you have to do it here, and you have to do it near the airport. And you have to do it for this business model where the, whether we pay them anything or not. One out of 10 jobs are retail jobs, but it only takes Amazon 50% of the number of people to deliver, distribute those goods. So you will see as Amazon doesn't want to dominate the marketplace. They want to be the marketplace. They want commerce to go through Amazon, and they're already halfway there online. One out of every $2 spent online goes through Amazon. 50% of all online searches begin and end on Amazon. 90% of small businesses in a survey of more than 850 small businesses feel their small businesses being negatively, adversely impacted by Amazon, and they're being forced to go on the Amazon website to do business. Harvard Business School study says that then what they do, Amazon does with their algorithms, you have to rise up the algorithms for people to see you, is that as you start to sell goods and do well, Amazon then starts to sell the same goods against you. Amazon then, then starts to punish you with higher and higher fees. Amazon is competing against our small businesses in so many different ways that we can and cannot appreciate at this time. They are hurting our local small businesses. They are hurting employment. They are going to decrease the number of retail jobs, which is 10% of all jobs. And we're paying them to do it. If, it, if they're going to do it, if, the free, if this is what the market is going to bring to us and Amazon is going to do that, let them do it. But why are we going to go borrow money, borrow money and pay interest on that for 20 years to then pay them to eat everybody's lunch? It's one thing if they do it on their own. It's another thing for us to pay them to do it to our people and our businesses, which they, they are going to cost us. This is going to hurt us jobs, Brent. And it, I just don't see the evidence-based public policy making. I didn't see it in the Economic Development Trust meeting. I didn't see the kind of questions that Amazon needs to answer in front of us. He needs to be here. He's a bully. He's calling. Uh, economic Development Trust members, and in and, and Larry's words, saying you need to shut your mouth, or keep your mouth quiet, I think he said. Keep your mouth shut, is what Larry said. Keep your that mouth shut. That, keep your mouth shut. Let's, then, let's, let's, that was a, 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 a summation of what he said. He said it very diplomatically and okay. politely, so he's also that calling, cannot be used against him. He's also calling the mayor's office. David hadn't even been elected. He doesn't even know that there's an Amazon incentive telling, you know, threat with heavy-handed language saying, you need to keep this quiet. It's, it is heavy handed, it is extreme, and it is, it's, going, uh, it's going to hurt us. Uh, estimates are 150,000 jobs have already been lost by 2015 from the dominance of Amazon in the, uh, in the marketplace. I, I, I don't expect uh, to win. I don't expect, you know, I expect that we're gonna, that we're gonna rubber stamp this. Uh, not rubber stamp, we're going to pass it. But all I'm asking, I'm asking a few things. Is that the process be improved, right? That it needs to slow down. There needs to be more public awareness. We need to change the non-disclosure agreements. We need diversity of thought on these economic development trusts. Diversity is not just about ethnicities or gender or sexual orientation. It's also about diversity of thought. And we don't have it right now. And, and that's, now we have an opening on the economic development trust, right? You've got four lockdown votes on the Economic Development Trust, right? So now you have an opening. I'm not, I, I get it. I'm, I can be abrasive. The supermajority of the council thinks I'm an ass. You're partially right, <laughs> right, at least, okay? So I, I'm not, but James, Todd, they, would, they have a diversity of thought. They're not uh, abrasive. They, you know, we need 
more, we need diversity of thought on that trust. We need people asking these corporations uh, tougher questions, right? Asking them how, you know, how, what is the net loss of jobs here? What is the net impact on jobs? Not just considering these things in a vacuum, Brent. Not just considering the economic impact in a vacuum, but also trying to figure out what it's going to do to our existing businesses and figuring out what the net economic impact is, what the net impact on jobs is. And those are the kind of questions we need to ask, we're not asking, and we need to ask them earlier in the process. Thanks. I don't know if there was, uh, there, there was a lot to unpack. There was anything you actually wanted him to answer? In? Okay. No. Okay. Uh, Councilman Greenwood? Yes, thank you. Uh, and Councilman Shadi, I don't think that's a true statement about us, our uh, thoughts about you. I welcome your okay. different views, and I think most members of the council do, so I would thank encourage you. you to continue. Now, I have to be careful, because I'll get just as excited as you did, but in a positive way towards this. Uh, but let me ask one question. So of the 1.7 million incentive that we're offering, 1 million will go towards, quote, infrastructure, such as traffic signals? 700,000. OK, so the million goes towards an incentive to reimburse them for the? Pay for performance job incentive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, well, let me make this statement. That's 700,000 as far as infrastructure uh, means that we'll pay the other half. They're actually putting 4.1 million, the total package is $4.1 million. See? We agreed to participate in 1.4 million yeah. of that, and our share of that is $700,000. Okay, here's my complaint. We needed those infrastructure a long time ago out there in Ward 5 and a little bit in Ward 3. It took Amazon to come out there to finally get these infrastructures. Just like a mile further south, it required Walmart to come in there for them to put in over $2 million of infrastructure to get traffic signals put in, which long ago needed it. So I'm seeing it from a positive perspective. The one problem that we had with Lariat Landing, and we still have it, is the connection of I-240 and I-44. It's a complex uh, intersection. And if we could somehow redesign that, and we might talk to Amazon before too long about them contributing to restructuring that intersection because it's hard for traffic coming in from the east on I-240 to get over there to where Lariat Landing is going to be. And uh, the curve on I-44 as you intersect 240 makes it difficult. So I understand the need for this decelerization lane uh, heading towards 89th Street. We need it. This is going to explode uh, the development of Lariat Landing. It's going to continue to enhance Oklahoma City Community College, which is just a mile east of the proposed plant. Uh, there's a bus system already going to Community College. We will uh, put in, hopefully, more sidewalks. Where's Eric? Uh, we need more sidewalks along 89th and 104th Street. These kinds of developments is just going to enhance the area. It's going to create, I guarantee you, and I'll bet on this, five years from now, that whole area is going to be substantially more developed than it is now as a result of these new jobs. And $45 million of new payroll coming into the market. Ed, I know you're a proponent of increasing the minimum wage. We don't need that. When we see all these new jobs coming in, these employers are going to have to begin increasing wages to compete for the employees. And I suspect they'll soon work with either the, um, I still want to call them the Votex systems, or Oklahoma City Community College, which will become their next door neighbor in offering uh, scholarship programs, uh, training specifically for their employees, I see this as a win. I am so grateful that this is occurring, and it's in a great location. When we can tell potential new companies looking at Oklahoma, well, sure, we've got Amazon right here, uh, doesn't everybody? It'll help sell the Oklahoma City market, and in particular, 
the airport, uh, and that's a critical area. The air, uh, the uh, aerospace industry is a high priority for the state. And now all of a sudden, you know, Amazon, on a positive perspective, made over three billion dollars in 2017. Three billion, thirty-three million dollars. Now we get to draw that into the state of Oklahoma. And while they've got space, the fact that they're going to add how many thousand square feet? 640,000. Yeah. We get a larger share of that $3.3 billion subject to taxation for the entire state. That's going to help the entire state now getting to draw their net income and subject to Oklahoma taxation. This is very positive. I think the return on this investment is underestimated based upon these numbers. I think it'll be tremendous. It'll be great. I, uh, I agree that, this, that Amazon coming here will be positive. I just don't think that, I just don't think a million dollar incentive is gonna make the deal happen. And it, which is why if we, if we move this incentive down to something that's more comparable to the other things based solely on the jobs, you know, in the hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollar range, uh, I wouldn't have any. I wouldn't have any problem with it. I just think that this is this okay. is in, inflated and and it's uh, not needed. Okay, yeah. I disagree with that. Okay. And if any of the reasons why we're upset with Amazon is because they're so profitable, then aren't we demonstrating a sign of discrimination? You know, like we don't want to help or we're not going to provide the same services because you make too much money. If we take that, where does that end? If, it's, if it meets the requirements of the terms of the Economic Development Council, no questions asked. It meets the requirements. We need to uh, provide that. If we're saying, no, we think they've made too much money on their own, then where does that stop? Do we then start saying we're no longer going to provide police and fire protection because you made too much money? We're going to make you, you know, obtain your own private security. I, I actually see this as discriminating in the opposite direction, that it's actually um, that we're not being equitable to other, to, to the, it, it's not the same incentive. And I understand that th those private investment uh, dollars get get thrown in there, which I don't know why that I don't know why those get thrown in there. But it it uh, so I, I, I see it as actually the opposite of of, but 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 I agree that we shouldn't be discriminating based on income or based on profitability. Right, and I would say this, James, we are going to get so much more return on this investment than we could with any smaller type uh, business. Granted, they may have greater needs for funding. That's, that's the life of small businesses and new startups. But from just purely an investment standpoint, we will reap so much greater investment by working with Amazon. And Ed, all the points that you made are actually true. Amazon has figured out how to compete in, in today's business environment. They took advantage of the growth uh, and development of technology, other companies are going to have to also. And speaking of loss of jobs in the retail market, that's going to continue as companies like Amazon make it much more easier for us to order things from our office or our home via the internet. If we want to do away with the internet, that's a, t a different discussion. I mean, there's good and bad points to that, but it's just the way things are now. It's impacting the oil and gas industry, there are so many losses of very gifted people who have been working in the oil and gas industry, but due to growth in technology, the development of technology, they don't need as many people identifying where the oil and natural gas is located, how to drill to it to make it uh, uh, produce it more economically and more efficiently, and then the process of drilling itself and then the production. Technology is going to continue to reduce the number of people, but at the same time, new technology creates new opportunity, new jobs, and those who are willing to stay in school, get a good education, are going to benefit tremendously by this, is my point. Thank you.
I just have a couple of comments, most of which have already been said. But Ed, I want to first of all say thank you for sending all those articles. I read them all. I appreciated getting the email. I think there were a lot of good facts in there, and it's helpful, you know, as we go through these discussions. So I was, I was glad to get those. Um, but just a couple of random thoughts. We're talking about the number of jobs that are being created, and the ones we're incenting are 50. But there are another 1,600 jobs, and I just want to tell you all a very quick story. I was at uh, Westminster School um, uh, last week working with their eighth grade class who spent a year studying poverty and all different aspects of it. And they worked, um, created a partnership recently with the Curbside Chronicle. I won't go through the whole details, but they actually created the program to sell Mother's Day flowers, and they took $12,000 that the students had earned in their seventh grade businesses and turned it into $35,000. Another part of this class's program was to look at um, livable wages and ask private businesses to uh, join a program called uh, Wage Up, where they would uh, guarantee that they would pay at least $12 an hour. These jobs are $12 to $14 an hour jobs in addition to the higher wage jobs. So we're not looking at substandard or non-livable wage in the rest of these jobs, even though they're not being incentivized. So that's one thing. Um, you know, we talk about the services that they're going to be providing. These are what our citizens are demanding. Our people want immediate delivery of things that they're ordering on Prime. And I think to be able to have that operation here in Oklahoma City speaks a lot following the kinds of things that David said. I. Um, so uh, uh, just a comment about Lariat Landing. We made a huge investment in that facility through the airport trust. And this is exactly what it was designed to do. You know, We got an aircraft facility business coming over there. And to attract Amazon to that location, again, following what David said, I think in five years, we're not going to recognize what Lariat Landing looks like. And that was a policy goal that was set by this council through our support of the airport trust development. Um, and I think lastly, I just want to say that since we've been having this conversation, I'm sure all of us have been talking to citizens and asking how they feel about this idea. And every person I've spoken to, and they're not just my inner circle, people in public places where I've asked, the response back to me was jobs are number one. It's jobs that we're looking for. And they were supportive of this level of investment. So for that reason, I'm going to vote for it. Now, just a couple of comments. Uh, Ed, thank you for that material. Uh, Ed has some material that uh, Meg has already alluded to. Uh, that material is put together to prove a point, And the point that they're trying to prove in there that incentives, especially to Amazon, are not the best way to go. Uh, there are two schools of thought. One says you should incentivize to move forward. Another school of thought says incentives are bad and should not be used. The marketplace uh, is moving towards incentives as an important part of being competitive. And therefore, that's why our gold bond program was put together, to provide resources to incentivize those jobs which would bring greater value to Oklahoma City than the cost of the incentive itself. When you apply that logic to this particular job, um, opportunity, it comes out that, yes, this is a good deal. Uh, one of the things I think we have neglected to do, usually in the incentivization of a new company coming in, we focus on jobs created, and we don't spend a whole lot of time looking at what happens from the investment in infrastructure that it, the company makes to move in here. When you apply that to the factors uh, of the the number of jobs at 53 at, at do qualify, you see that this has a tremendous economic benefit to the area. And so it, uh, I think we've been a little short-sighted sometimes in not stressing the infrastructure, the equipment, and the things that the company invests in there. And the other thing we talked about, Larry at Landing, if you want to see a beautiful wheat field that uh, lays dormant most of the time, Look at the current site on the airport trust land that this facility is going to uh, take up. It's going to turn some uh, agricultural land on the airport 
into a dynamic generator of economic opportunity with uh, a lot of uh, opportunity to partner with uh, OCCC. Uh, you have bus service already going there. You have air, uh, roadways already going in there. There's one thing you need to keep in mind. You may or may not know. Uh, the Turnpike Authority and ODOT is already looking at where their next expansion of the interstate system is going to be now that they've got that loop going from uh, out by Yukon to the airport that's in construction right now. There are already meetings going on about what to do with that stretch of land that you're talking about on I-44 that is so congested. And so this will fit right in with that, and uh, you'll, you'll see some new highways coming from the state because of this study that's going on right now. Thank you, Your Honor. Any further questions for Brent or discussion? You know, I think I'd just add that I, I, I yield, I do not yield to the councilman from uh, wards one or two in my hatred of incentives, but it is the game that cities are forced to play. And um, we want those jobs, and I, I have a really hard time walking away from them. Um, and the voters, I think, obviously have a similar view. They have twice approved this program by a vote of the people, you know, and uh, I think we have an obligation to carry out their wishes, um, hopefully as wisely and as thoughtfully as possible. Um, and I think one other thing that's worth piggybacking on something that Councilman McAtee said was that, um, and the city manager just came up with this calculation, that Amazon will spend $2.9 million in sales tax building their facility in our city limits, which um, you know, Councilman Shadid, I think, uh, is somewhat compelling in his argument that their business model dictates a facility in the Oklahoma City Metro, but it did not necessarily, although we'll never know, dictate a facility within our city limits, but we will benefit from $2.9 million in sales tax because of that facility, and I'm just talking about the construction costs of the, of the almost $200 million, is that correct? $140 million facility. So that is worth noting as well. Um, but I do think, you know, I, I have enough discomfort with some of the aspects of this particular process to take some things to heart that Councilman Shadid said, including, um, you know, giving careful consideration to the, to the appointment that I now have for the Economic Development Trust, um, as well as, you know, trying to get uh, involved in the process earlier. You know, I didn't know about this. Uh, I knew vaguely of the project for some time, but I didn't know anything about the incentives until recent days, and that's just by nature of me just having taken office. But, uh, you know, I think all of that is, is, are things that I'll definitely pay attention to in the future and, and consider some of the things you said about non-disclosures and, and the other ways that we've, we've run these things. Um, I understand that, again, that's all part of the game as well with these, with these companies, but that doesn't mean we can't um, try to assert um, our own terms in some regards. So those are just a few thoughts, and I thank everybody for a very healthy discussion. Um, I don't know that we have a motion or a second yet. No, we, we have a motion. Uh, a second? Sorry. Second from Councilman Stone. Is there any further, any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, we will, this is item 7AX, and uh, we obviously pulled it out of the consent docket earlier, and we will now cast our votes on it individually. Cast your votes passes five to two. Thank you. We will now return back near the end of the agenda. I believe we are on item 11, items from council. Councilman Greiner, how about we start with you? Councilman Shadid? Everybody's exhausted from the uh, Amazon. I didn't get to speak during the last debate, so I will. I'll take my time now. Thank you. And uh, Councilman Shadid, I too appreciate your objectiveness, but I'd rather be known as a little abrasive than non-abrasive. So <laughs> I just wanted to give a shout out real quick to the Police Athletic League. We had our pal jam last Saturday. Um, I got to hear Chief City get up and. Uh, speak kind words to all of the volunteer coaches that showed up out there. Uh, it was hosted out at uh, Taft Stadium with the uh, energy, and the energy turned it into a great night with a 1-0 victory. So uh, it was just a, a great time had by all. 
Thanks. Councilman Greenland. Oh, no, thank you. I just want to congratulate James Greiner on receiving yes. his MBA. That's <laughs> awesome, James, how you found the time to do that with all the little ones at home. And the, it's really wonderful. I'm real proud of you. Congratulations, indeed. Um, City, uh, so that concludes item 11. We now have item 12, city manager reports. Jim. And first up is Mike Carriers from CVB to give us an update. Mike, please reintroduce yourself and give your address if you wouldn't mind. Certainly. <laughs> Mike Carrier, president of the Oklahoma City Convention and Visitors <laughs> Bureau. Uh, my office is at 123 Park Avenue and I live uh, out in northwest side of town on, at uh, 5409 Northwest 107th Terrace. So, uh, and uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here for your the first time uh, mm -hmm. addressing uh, the council with you in the in the, the main seat. So uh, uh, you all have in front of you a copy of our third quarter report along with our uh, uh, marketing, marketing plan and budget for next year. Uh, and we're very pleased, pleased to give you an update on our progress uh, through three quarters. Um, you'll note uh, in our uh, program that our, our sales team's efforts continue to pay dividends as we move forward. Um, in our comparison of uh, fiscal 18 to fiscal 17, we are in fact a little bit ahead of where we were this time last year. Uh, and at about 79% of, uh, of the target that we have for the year in our convention and sports sales. So well on our way as we move forward. Um, we're, we're looking, uh, in addition, uh, our tourism sales, which is motor coaches uh, primarily and, and uh, tourism groups, uh, while we're only at 68%, the, hip, the most uh, prominent quarter that we have every year is the fourth quarter of the year, uh, spring, when we see a lot of folks beginning to travel uh, over spring break and uh, into April and May, and obviously some of the programs that are going on that uh, do attract groups to come here. Uh, plus our equine business, we're at 76%, uh, overall 77% uh, of our target, so we are well on the way to having another very good year. Um, hotel tax, and I know uh, there's a, a, a report later on the, uh, the agenda uh, on this in perhaps a little more depth, but uh, I wanted to particularly point out two things. First of all, through the three quarters, we're at seven, we have a 7.4% increase in our hotel tax over last year. That is a significantly high number and, and a great number that we're seeing. Um, but the receipts of, of $10.8 million dollars, the highest three quarters collection in the history of, this, of the city. Uh, so, you know, we're doing quite well. Um, and even as we look at the raw demand for rooms through three quarters, uh, and we'll hold on that one for just a minute. That's fine, Jane. Thank you. When you look at the raw demand for rooms over the, the running 12 months, the last 12 months of business, we have added 206,000 hotel room nights in Oklahoma City, and we have actually sold 269,000 additional room nights compared to the, the prior year. So we have sold every single room night that was added plus more. Uh, so you know, we're, we're doing well uh, in terms of our tourism economy. Uh, when we move, as we move forward, uh, if you look back just 10 years, here are many of the primary function or primary uh, assets we had to promote. But if you look at the foreseeable future and what's coming up, uh, you look at all of the items in red, these are things that are e either have been developed over the last 10 years or are coming. Things like the Indian Cultural Center and Museum, the park, uh, the new uh, convention center, you look at some of the other assets that we have now, uh, all of those things are, uh, are being added and going to require an even stronger effort on our part uh, as we move forward. Um, today under uh, agenda item uh, seven uh, AV, you received and uh, approved it by consent uh, in terms of the receipt of it, our marketing plan and budget for next year, which helps significantly in what we're doing. Uh, our marketing plan was uh, included in the packet that was sent to you. Uh, obviously, I don't expect you to read all of the, what you see in front of you, but it's just a representation of 
the cover and, and the table of contents. There's a lot of work that goes into this document uh, from our staff as well as the Convention and Visitors Commission uh, to make sure that we're covering as many different areas as we can. Uh, and then our budget request, which this year includes an increase of 11.9% over last year. Uh, that's made possible partially by the significant increase in hotel tax that is being generated, but also uh, the steadfast, uh, the steady increases that we have seen in the past several years, along with uh, good management by the budget department here at the city, as well as uh, the CVB uh, carefully watching what we spend, knowing that we had a lot of these assets coming. I came here 11 years ago when we were talking then about when the, the Indian Cultural Center was going to open. Well, now, thanks to you all and to uh, the Chickasaw Nation in the state, we actually can see the light at the end of that tunnel. Uh, with the new convention center coming, with the new Scissortail Park, a lot of new things that uh, we're going to be out there promoting, uh, and it's going to cost more money. And so uh, that's... That's where we have included uh, a significant increase this year, working with uh, Mr. Dowler and the folks in the, uh, the budget department for the city. Uh, we look forward to your all's support on this. We've got some great plans uh, looking uh, forward uh, beginning in just a few weeks uh, in the introduction of the new convention center and uh, hotel and uh, all of the things that make up that area of the city in terms of new opportunities. And so. We're excited about what's coming. We look forward to continuing to get out and, and promote Oklahoma City and show people all of the different things that we have to, uh, to offer and continue to increase not just the hotel tax collections, but the city's sale tax, sales tax collections and the occupancy in our hotels and venues around the city. So I'll be happy to answer questions, but appreciate your all's continued support uh, as we move forward. Thank you, Mike. Thank Thanks you, sir. for all you do. It's Appreciate times. it. Look forward to working with you. <laughs> Likewise. Mr. Mayor, we do have a sales and use tax collections report on for May, and I'm, you're going to get tired of me hearing this because every month I'm going to say for the next nine months is you can't compare this to last year because <laughs> the tax rate's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So when you see that it's up 18.4% over last year, you got to consider that there's an extra quarter cent in there. So you got to look at the projections, and the projections are good. It's 3% over projections. So it's a solid month, and it's a good trend for us so far. But as you look at those, don't get too excited when you see that it's 18% over last year, because it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So, so what, was, what was the quarter, forgive me, I know this is an easy calculation, but what is a quarter percent rate increase? Um, what percentage of that is? 12 and a half. 12 and a half. Yeah. So an 18% increase is still ahead of the game. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Mike talked about the, the hotel motel tax, so I won't cover that, and that Go concludes ahead. the city manager. I just have a question. So what, what are your thoughts on the Fair Marketplace Act? I mean, where we have any chance after 20 years any, of passage as an impact? I mean, what, where do you? Well, it really depends what the Supreme Court, you know, if, yeah. when, when they die. I think that's our best option. And that's next month? Yes, sir. OK. So that, that's happening. I, um, I think. Congress was close to going after it, but they don't want to. They don't want to do this, so they they're, they punted it to the Supreme Court. So if the Supreme Court doesn't come down well, then the question is going to be whether or not Congress is, now that that avenue is, is, is closed down. But you know, I'm optimistic that there could be a positive a ruling from the Supreme Court. Okay, and that would that would that would equalize things. Let me just ask because I can't help myself. Am, Amazon currently doesn't charge sales tax for third-party vendors, correct? That's correct. But there's a, a uh, part, of, part of the uh, increases for the teacher pay includes the closing of, 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 of that gap. Okay. And um, I don't know exactly. How, it, 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 it was an intent was to close that. Whether it can be done or whether it will do that or not, I don't know at this point in time. We don't know for sure. So we're going to see how that, that, that plays out. But that could also help from, from that legislation that was done at the end of the legislative session. And was the state legislation on third-party vendors? Yes. Okay. So I know just enough about that to be dangerous because I actually voted for that while I was still a Good senator. Job. Good job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and what that 
Yeah, that apparently is applicable to third-party vendors and maybe half a dozen states have passed it and Amazon has complied and so Oklahoma is under the view that Amazon will comply with this. Okay. Um, and so it, it uh, there was a dollar amount associated with Oklahoma City, if I remember. Yeah, but I don't remember what that number was and we did not budget it this year because okay. we, we wanted to see it produced before we... It was millions. Though. Yes, it was. It's yes, like it was. four million, I think. That sounds yeah, right. Could be. That yeah. sounds right. Okay. okay. Any, any other questions for Jim under item 12? Okay, uh, and item 12D is just informational. If you want claims and payroll, that's available uh, under the agenda on our website at okc.gov. And now we are finally at item 13, citizens to be heard. After that, we'll go into executive session. Uh, we do have two citizens who have signed up. Uh, first up, and you'll have to forgive me, so please repronounce your name when you come to the podium. Uh, Yasin Alsui. Did I kind of nail it? That's good. <laughs> Well, please, please come to the podium, introduce yourself and your address, and, uh, and try to keep your remarks under three minutes, please. Uh, my name is Yasin Etawi, uh, address 320 North Villa, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73107. Um, it's been two years going on this subject, going on for two years, and I've been pushing a little bit by little bit. It was concerning Chapter 5641. It's concerning the ordinance on the vehicles for hire. Uh, there was so much going on, and the last time I was here, back in November 2017, Dr. Shadid asked for examples. We've been talking about just doing like the other cities, which is regulating this inspection and all that stuff. So I brought examples with me, and at the same time, I'll be here happy to answer all your questions. Currently, here in Oklahoma City, we don't have no regulations. We just have somebody must be certified, and that certification is international. So anybody can come from China, sign the papers and leave, really. There is no liability on any person. And um, that certificate really does not mean anything. I've been working, this is why, this does not mean anything, really. Uh, most of the cities, they, uh, either the mechanical inspections go through the state or either the city. I'll just give you a quick example. For example, here our electrical, plumbing, heat and air contractors, they go through the state and the state gives you a car, then take it to the licensing and the licensing, they go further with you. Like utility contractor, they don't go through the state, they go to the city directly. You know, there is a board member. Mechanical inspection was implemented here in Oklahoma City, I believe, just like five years ago or something. And Mainly, whoever did it did, did such a poor job, really. Once you do something, just do it all the way. And we barely, like uh, November 2017, we barely kind of agreed with the legal department and the police department, okay, yeah, we need um, this inspection to be done on the lift, for example, just prop appropriate mechanical device. Uh, but still open, you know. Uh, what happened lately, a few months ago, uh, there was an accident. This accident, uh, this is how it, ha how it happened. The car was just driving on the highway, and the car co came to a complete stop, a lockdown. And what happened, the truck behind it hit it with 70 miles an hour. The driver, his dad bad, uh, the passenger and the driver bad, really hurt, really bad. Anyway, this is not my case or anything, but I was trying to help, and they came to me, they told me how this inspection is supposed to be done, and this and this. I helped as much as I could. Um, this is some examples right now as I'm talking. I'll be, you guys can be, you guys can look at these examples. I'll be. Um, the ordinance was changed a little bit uh, after a meeting with the chief, Bill City, and Patrick Stewart, and, uh, and he went to sleep for a while. Then I contacted Mr. Baldurama. He's the one who got really upset about this and started talking with the legal department and going further, further. Finally, they, they made little changes where it needs to be done. What happened before is the papers that these mechanical inspections, they were sold on street, and solid proofs were provided to the police department and the, the legal departments, but no action was taken up till today. Uh, what I did, I just searched, like the, most of the states, they have a state mechanical inspection, and some states, they don't. So I called the uh, city of Seattle, just like us here, city of Minneapolis. They don't have state inspection. 
So what I did, I told them, what does it take for me guys to be on your list to inspect your vehicle for hires? Uh, Seattle responded back on email and Minneapolis, he was on the phone. Well, they need the, um, here's the email. What he said, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, Austin, he said, I was notified that your business was interested in becoming a certified inspection mechanic for vehicle for hires. But he said, there are items that need to happen to certify your business as, as, a, cert, uh, as, a, qualific uh, as a as an inspection station. First of all, he said that you gotta be certified, you gotta go through training sessions, we need to do shop inspection, and you gotta go through the director's rule, and the fourth, they ask for certificates of liability of insurance, which every garage here must have one. Either if you don't have it, you put the customer at risk and you put yourself at risk. So I don't see any reason. Well, this is what's going on. I'll go back to that accident. That accident was the car was taken. The highway patrol couldn't make any reports because he didn't know how come this car just came in the middle of the highway and stopped. The driver and the passenger didn't have time to run away from the car. By the time she was opening the door, she was really slammed from the back. They took that car, they took it to third party to be investigated what's, what's going on, how come this car stopped. They found it to be not even qualified, way, way below qualifications of what the city is asking for, for minimum safety standards. So what happened, they, uh, they investigated the person who uh, signed on this paper. They, they have the, he, uh, he doesn't have anything. He just have a motorcycle, a couple of saddle bags. He grabbed the paper, he copied the VIN number, he gives them money, he gives you the paper, and that's how it goes which is really shame. I didn't even have to come up to talk about this. I felt for a while it's shame talking about this. I mean, I'm in the cab business too. We lost quite a bit to Uber, but that's, that's a completely different subject, you know. Mm -hmm. But this inspection, you know, we don't have any regulations here. And I, Mr. Couch, I really urge you this year, uh, by the way, next 10 days, the, the police department will be receiving around six, 700 inspections. I would really urge you right now, at least just as a priority, just to have all the businesses sign in, they have, to, uh, they have to bring their insurance to the police department. At least the police department makes sure that the garage liability insurance match the name of that insurance and the address and everything and the phone number because the person who's been submitting all that stuff before, the, the business does not even exist. The address belongs to different corporations. Uh, no, uh, he has no address where it's, I mean, it's just, it's just a mess. It's okay. just a mess. Well, thank you, Mr. al -Tuid. And um, I understand you've been working with Chief City and his team in the past on this. And so I, I did. Mr. Baldurama, he's the only one actually I was working on. The rest, okay. believe me, I, uh, I felt like they were sleepy. I'll just be honest with you. Okay. But Mr. Raba, Mr. Baldurama, he did a really good job. He met with my attorneys in, tra in front of the traffic commission. My attorneys were fixing to... Uh, Propose more regulations, but they asked uh, they asked that Tony back then. Well, said we have to think about it, modify something. Mr. Baldrama, he was asked, "Do you guys need insurance?" Said, "Yes, we need insurance, but we have no authority to ask for insurance." So I'm here. I mean, who who does have the authority to ask if not the police department? Somebody has to ask for okay. it. All right. Well, I, this is all new to me, so I'm going to follow up with Chief City. I really appreciate it. Uh, I came here thank also. You. I forgot at the beginning. I wanted to congratulate, congratulate oh, you, you in your position. Well, you buried the lead. And uh, we appreciate you no, for pushing thanks. for diversity, too. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank coming you. down. I'll, I'll follow up with Chief City and try to understand more about the background. Did you have something? I did have something. I wanted to recognize Honorable Vicki Miles LaGrange, who's here in the <laughs> audience with us today. <laughs> thanks for being here, Vicki. <laughs> um, very good, yes, welcome. Oklahoma legend, Vicki Miles LaGrange. Um, we also have Ronnie uh, Kirk has signed up. Ronnie, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and stating your address and keeping it uh, to three minutes or less, please. My name is Ronnie Kirk. I'm 2328 North Missouri, here in Oklahoma City. Hi. Ed, first I want to say thanks for speaking up for the small businesses. On May the 8th, I came to the city council meeting. On May the 10th, I received a letter from the code enforcer 
saying I wasn't here. The first thing I did, I was on the agenda. I went, I filled out two slips, one for being on the agenda. So me and the chief inspectors, we had worked this out first over in the office over here. But the code enforcer sent this letter out, saying they're going to try to, if I didn't repair it or secure it by June the 9th, it would be bulled over and turned over. I called the number that he left on the paper, and I told him. I said, you didn't watch the city council meeting. I sat through the whole meeting. I spoke, I was the only one who spoke that day on Citizens to Speak. I called him twice to make sure he got the message. I said, don't just, I said, like you sent me this letter in two days saying I was not here on May the 8th. I said, send me a letter so I can show that I was there. I said, I'm on YouTube. So, so Everybody Kirk, knows it. May I interrupt? Did you have an item? You also had a, I remember you speaking two weeks ago. Yes, sir. to be heard on, on gun issues, if I recall. Did you also, you're saying you also had a, a structure that happened to be under our unsecured? Yes, sir, Arizona, to secure my building. Okay. And uh, secure it and board it up. So, so, so uh, when we come to those items, and when I'm presiding as I was two weeks ago, I always ask the audience, is there anyone who's here to speak about any of these items under unsecured? And you did not Yeah, I, I, I said right here, but I'd, we'd already, already went over and, and talked with the chief inspectors, mm -hmm. two of them. I got the cards right here. And they said they would come over and, and, and take care of it. And so when it came up on the, on the screen, I thought it was all, all taken care of. When I got the letter two days later saying I hadn't been here, so I didn't speak on it when it came on the screen because the gentleman said they would take care of it. So when, when I got the letter and, and two days after I was here, well, uh, it said they're going to tear it down in June the 9th. And I knew I was here. I told I said, look on YouTube. It was on there. And so, I was also saying, uh, I, the main reason I got here on May the 8th was to talk about securing my building, showing that I had done the work to secure my building, the whole sealed up, and, and make it sure it was secured. And the a second reason I wanted to come, so I could get in here and speak before the mayor had signed, those, the, the governor had signed those papers. But I mainly came to speak on this today, where the, 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 code, the code enforcer know that I'd been here. I found a building that was destroyed okay. five years ago, and I bought the pictures for y'all to see, and it's still on screen. My place is more secure than it is. So Charles Locke is here with code enforcement. Um, would you mind if he came to that podium? And That's just fine. Okay, and maybe explain what's going on. We spoke to Mr. Kirk last council meeting. Uh, the letter he's referring to is basically a form letter that, that tells him that his item was on the agenda and that he has, by state statutes, 30 days in which to either make the repairs or, you know, get a hold of us. Uh, but during when he talked to us before his item came up, we understand he hired a company out of Norman to repair his property and advised him if he'd send that to us, we'd work with him. And we're still waiting on that, but he's still within his 30 days. That's that June 9th date he's referring to. So you're saying he shouldn't necessarily be con too concerned about the letter that he received? No, it's just giving him that 30 days by state law, which is, you know, what we send to everybody that's, that's declared. It's not saying that on June 10th we're tearing it down. It just, he needs to, you know, uh, give us a plan on what is his reconstruction, which he talked to us about. He's got a, he said he'd hired a company out of Norman. Is that, yes, sir. Isn't that correct? And we're just waiting on that uh, to review it. And, and if we get that, we'll work with him. And he did not necessarily sacrifice any rights by not having spoken two weeks ago under the unsecured items. No, he had not handled at all. what he needed to handle with you. 
not at all. We advi and we advised him that we'd be getting that letter stating that it, that it had been declared and what he needs to do is get a hold of us, provide us with a, basically a timeline from the company he'd hired, and, and we're fine. Well, on the back of one paper, it says you had a 180 days, and when we talked, it said six months to a year, and on this letter, it said 30 days from the code enforcer. Mr. Kirk, you, you really need to make, make sure that you get the information into Charles that says that you got the contractor from Norman and that you're yes, making progress on it. That's, that's, if, you continue to, if, you, if you do that and work with Charles, you're going to be fine. We're gonna, we, I, I, my plan is to work with him Great. and to get these things done. But 30 days is not enough time for me to get everything done. The place is secured. It's all, all been boarded up and we've been working on it now. If you to get a, make sure we follow in If you get compliance. a time frame to him and let you, and, and a contract with your contractor, whatever you're going to do, and get a time frame to him, he's, he has the authority to work with you to that'd make be, that happen. be fine. We'll be happy to talk with you, Metric Council, too. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. Is there anyone else under Citizens to be Heard? Seeing none, we will now go into executive session as per our earlier vote on item 9R, and we will return. <laughs>